Well, welcome everyone. Everyone got their seats? So welcome to the third session of Conservative Meets the General Public. The third session will be about the image of the conservator in the public eye and how we can present ourselves and represent our profession. My name is Amber Kerr, and I've mentioned before that I am the chief conservator at the Lunder Conservation Center for the Smithsonian American Art Museum. And for those who are not familiar with our center, we are a fully visible conservation lab with floor to ceiling glass walls. There's absolutely no way that we can hide from the public. And uh, what's really been interesting is I was able to join the lab in my third year of internship from the Winnetou University of Delaware program in art conservation. When the museum closed for renovations in 1999, it was the conservators who actually stepped forward, wanting to have a visible conservation lab. And through the years of closure, which was about nine years, they really advocated for the different ways in which they could communicate with the public. But what was interesting, and you can actually go back into the American Institute of Conservation newsletters, was the field's reaction to this idea of a visible conservation lab a bunch of conservatives working behind glass for the public to watch in clear view. And there's a lot of interesting comments that came about during those years. And as a rising conservator going into graduate school, I often heard about the quote unquote fishbowl and what it was gonna be like and how it was gonna be horrible for the field and everybody was just in angst over what was gonna happen. Now what's really been interesting in having the honor of having gone there as a third year intern and then being there two years as a fellow and then being hired as a paintings conservator and now I'm head of the lab. So in over the last 13 years, it's been very interesting to see the absolute opposite happening in the field of conservation and how much change has occurred in just 13 years and how many now visible fishbowls there are around the world showing what conservation is about. So it is a great honor to actually be here today to um, be a part of this particular session and to be amongst the colleagues for whom you can ask some wonderful questions about how we represent ourselves as professionals in the world to the public. So let me begin by introducing your speakers today. The first speaker will be Hilke Hiap. Hilke is a professor at the Estonian Academy of Art, Department of Cultural Heritage and Conservation. She was trained as an art historian at the Tartu University and got her MA degree in conservation from the Estonia Academy of Art. In 2012, she finalized her PhD research on the conservation management of contemporary art. Additional professional experience has included conservation internships at the Gemeldeger, <laughs> I hope I said that correctly, in Berlin, uh, the ICN in Amsterdam, and uh, she had worked in Rome conserving mural paintings. She has supervised a number of conservation and technical investigation projects in Estonia, curated exhibitions, and conducted scientific research on conservation and technical art history. Our second speaker will be Patria Noble, head of paintings conservation at the Rijksmuseum. Patria Noble is a senior paintings conservator and head of paintings conservation at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, a position she has held since 2014. Prior to this, she worked for 18 years as a painting conservator at the Moritz House in The Hague. As an expert in the material aspects of 17th century Dutch paintings, she has co-published widely in conservation and scientific journals. She is a strong advocate for scientific investigations of paintings as a key to understanding artists' materials, condition, and the development of science-based conservation treatments. Her recent research activities include the application of non-invasive imaging techniques for the study of late Rembrandt paintings. Her current research focus is the technical investigation of Rembrandt's Night Watch from 1642 in the Rijksmuseum. Our third speaker will be Ralph Uva Johan, Managing Director of Defner and Johan. Ralph Uva is Managing Director and owner of Def Defner and Johan, based in Germany. The company is a leading supplier of materials, tools, and equipment for conservation and preservation professionals in over 50 countries, with a tradition dating back to 1880. Ralph Uwe has held management positions in global tech firms in Germany and the US before returning to Schweinfurt in 2008 and succeeding in the fifth generation of the family business. For many years, he has awarded scholarships to students for conservation and restoration, advancing and enabling international learning and sharing best practice. And our final, but certainly not least speaker, is Isa von Lund. 
Issa von Lanta completed her master's degree in conservation and restoration of paintings and sculptures at the University of Applies Arts in Bern, Switzerland. Before she did a two-year internship in two private restoration studios in Florence, Italy, and graduated from the Goering Institute in Munich, Germany, with a bachelor equivalent. Issa is currently doing a fellowship at the SRAL, SRAL in Maastricht, where she is working on various projects. In 2017, Issa helped to organize the IIC SECC conference in Bern, and since February this past year, she has been the coordinator for the IIC Instagram account. So please, let's welcome our first speaker. We have uh, Hilke, can you come to the speaker, please? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody, and then I'm starting as, uh, as I'm the only one who has a slide. So, uh, and, but maybe it's also nice to see some, uh, some images uh, as um, yeah. And um, maybe we can put a bit of the light, yeah. And um, <clears throat> actually, um, I'm talking about uh, two uh, projects uh, just uh, shortly. And, uh, and uh, uh, the one project, which was probably also the reason uh, I was invited here uh, was the project we were running uh, uh, three years and uh, we had a great honor to uh, get the Keck uh, award last year and that's why probably I'm here today but as it's already like over three years and I were talking too much about it I, I am uh, uh, more focusing on the second project we are running just now but uh, yes uh, but uh, indeed, let's start with the Rhoda project, which actually got a lot of attention and a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of uh, awards as well. And um, <coughs> uh, it's always I'm I, both projects. Are actually, uh, uh, I'm not uh, telling about the goal of the goals of the projects, but they are focusing on technical investigation and, and conservation. But I'm uh, now focusing more on the uh, public communication side, as this is top topic uh, top of our uh, our panel so uh, I'm just uh, um <clears throat> Uh, quoting the quoting the uh, uh, IIC uh, uh, web page remark that uh, the public facing components were among the project's greatest achievements and the deliberate uh, prior uh, prioritization sorry <laughs> about the outreach activities was uh, indeed successful in uh, capturing popular attention and this was always mentioned in the pro project that uh, we had a lot of uh, public activities different public activities which we I'm not uh, I'm not uh, um uh telling right now because we don't have enough time but uh, just to give you a uh, short or a hint what the project was focusing on uh, it's actually um one of the greatest uh, artworks uh, we have in Estonia, which was center of this uh, project. It's a late 15th century author piece coming from Lübeck, uh, uh, from Hermann Rode's workshop, uh, which probably uh, many, uh, many uh, know about the uh, great workshop uh, of uh, Hermann Rode. And uh, in uh, parallel, uh, parallel, we had a great chance also to uh, carry out similar, uh, similar investigation uh, on the other uh, and uh, actually only signed author piece uh, made uh, by Hermann Rode's workshop in uh, Lübeck St. Anne Museum. And as Estonia is uh, uh, considered to be a great IT country, we always try to uh, create also uh, web applications to show our, uh, show our investigation results in a popular way or to a broader public. But, but and here you see uh, uh, just an example. Uh, which was created due to the exhibition uh, in in uh, Lübeck in already four years ago uh, about uh, Hans Adikat in in uh, Hansa period, and here you can uh, compare the infrared images uh, and uh, etc. 
But as uh, as I I mentioned already, actually, all these four years we have had a oh, three years actually we had a lot of public uh, public communication events, uh, both uh, or, uh, both educational and and also uh, uh, oriented towards the professional public, and and also uh, many uh, many. Um, uh, whatever uh, media events and, and social media communication, but for today I just picked up uh, one uh, one uh, uh, activity I uh, personally liked a lot uh, was um, the program uh, which uh, actually the initiative came uh, by the teachers, chemistry teachers uh, uh, society, and uh, and um, they uh, developed a special program for gym uh, gymnasium uh, pupils, which I just again I show you a short clip about it. Uh, it's still going on actually the the, the study in a gymnasium level, uh, 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 the students. Um, uh, uh, are learning chemistry through our uh, kind of research results, so using uh, our research results. And in, even uh, in chemistry books, uh, uh, there is uh, our Rode, Rode, Rode piece is published, and, and uh, that's uh, uh, and partially actually the, the, the study program is uh, carried out. Uh, by by, uh, by the teachers, chemistry teachers, and it's partially in uh, St. Nicholas Church where the auto piece is uh, situating, but it goes on in chemistry classes. And then uh, certainly hundreds and hundreds of Estonian pupils chem uh, uh, learned, uh, learned uh, uh, through the chemistry, uh, learned uh, also a little bit about uh, art, art conservation, and values of cultural heritage and our, our uh, activities. So uh, this is just an, uh, uh, one example. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the project we are uh, running just now, and which will be also finished quite soon, uh, is um, <clears throat> another uh, big investigation project. Again, I'm not going to uh, uh, talk about the uh, objective of the investigation, and, and, uh, but it's a certainly a multidisciplinary uh, team who is running the project uh, and has uh, uh, art historians, uh, historians, uh, conservators, scientists, etc. Uh, and it is about uh, uh, the oeuvre of, of um, one of our most outstanding, uh, outstanding Baroque artists uh, called Christian Ackermann, who is actually a German origin artist and, and uh, came to Estonia and, and uh, made many, many, uh, altogether around 20 uh, uh, big uh, church artworks. Uh, and his main artwork is, uh, you see, on, on the screen uh, is the main other piece in uh, uh, Tallinn, Tallinn Cathedral, where we actually uh, started also our project. Uh, but uh, today, yes, uh, we are surrounded with uh, uh, so many professionals. Uh, uh, I'm just, uh, uh, I picked up a few uh, things we were doing uh, uh, during, during the project uh, and, and uh, doing uh, especially uh, together with the students. Uh, and um, uh, how to put it? Uh, as uh, we, uh, it's an aspect which uh, maybe became for myself personally uh, uh, very interesting was uh, is, is the fact that I, we are uh, part our department the department of conservation is uh, part of academy of art which means that we are surrounded by creative artists and we are uh, quite a lot collaborating and having touch with uh, creative artists and uh, just to think how to combine this creative and conservative approaches and, and uh, what can be done with this, uh, 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 in collaboration with, with creative artists. And, uh, and one of the nice things I just picked up for today was, uh, and very successful uh, events, uh, was uh, actually started with the workshop of, of uh, our students, uh, uh, meaning of, of uh, students of, of architecture, uh, interior architectures, uh, graphic art, uh, 
uh, graphic uh, designers and then conservators, and uh, we designed uh, a scaffolding uh, during, uh, it was a real architecture competition, and uh, uh, as we had to start to investigate and conserve the uh, big water piece, we designed the scaffolding. It was really a competition, and then the best project was selected, and then certainly in engineers uh, uh, were part of the part of the team, and etc. etc. And uh, this uh, uh, scaffolding, which was not meant uh, only for working, but also for uh, kind of walking for people who are interested uh, on, on the conservation, it's 10 meters high, so it's uh, made in a way that, uh, uh, that um, <coughs> People could also visit uh, the site, visit, uh, our, uh, visit uh, and also understand our work. It was also a conservation uh, a studio behind the scaffolding. And so um, it uh, appeared to be so popular. Initially, the scaffolding was meant to be there for one, one month, but in the end, uh, it was uh, stood there for one year. And I think altogether 3,000 people, we counted more or less, visited the scaffolding or made a scaffolding tour. And it's again the moment to, to uh, uh, I, because I was, oh, yeah, not only me, but, but uh, we had to, uh, it uh, was a certain gr group visit or guided visits, uh, and, and uh, <clears throat> how um, emotional it was for people who are not, uh, never were in scaffolding, how emotional this uh, scaffolding tour was uh, to people, and, and also uh, how uh, uh, much um, somehow attention it gained. And uh, uh, just uh, uh, listening to uh, the previous panel, uh, I just came in, uh, came in my mind that it, uh, by chance it happened to be uh, in the same period when Estonia had a presidency of EU, and then it was part of the cultural program of, of presidency, and also many European ministers uh, came to uh, scaffolding visit, and maybe also it's a, a way to give, uh, to uh, we were talking before, for the, uh, um, that we should speak to authorities as well. So, uh, so uh, yeah. And uh, uh, I uh, I'm uh, not uh, telling, as I told, uh, about the investigation we do, but still, again, uh, bringing out some uh, uh, maybe more interesting aspects. Uh, because, uh, like, Always. We are using uh, different imaging techniques uh, for our investigation and um, <clears throat> uh, uh, X-ray imaging. We are carrying out in collaboration with Estonian uh, Tax and Custom Board, and which is also again uh, it's a, a kind of great collaboration in sense of uh, of uh, or in for both sides, I would say because our custom board is using uh, the investigation. They are always coming with us in different churches all, all around in Est Estonia. And for them, it's also a way to teach their stuff, to understand, uh, uh, understand how to recognize illegal cultural heritage or how to use the, uh, the, uh, the portative X-ray uh, equipment for uh, detecting the heritage. Uh, but... Uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, while I picked up this example was uh, the, the uh, X-ray image, images as such. We all know why it's used for, for study purpose, but, uh, uh, but they are also beautiful as a visual material, certainly. And uh, um, that was a reason why, uh, not only this, but, but uh, uh, a reason why a group of uh, photographic artists uh, from Academy, they uh, liked uh, not only the X-ray, but uh, the uh, visual material we are producing uh, during our investigation so much that they, are, uh, they created a, a, a beautiful exhibition about it. Uh, and uh, actually the nicest thing, uh, they created a prototype for lamps. Uh, uh, lamps uh, uh, based on the X-ray images of of, uh, of uh, Christian Ackermann Ouvre, and uh, uh, again, it's something which. Uh, somehow by itself uh, uh, became so popular that now uh, there is a uh, huge, oh, huge, 
small exhibition in Estonian uh, uh, custom board, which is housing 2,000 people who are working there, and, and also many people who, in uh, one other reason, have to visit the, uh, visit the custom board. And, and uh, now, recently, uh, the lamps ended up also in Estonian embassy in Brussels. And this is the way, again, it's not that uh, we as a researchers are organizing all this uh, thing, but, but it somehow lives their own lives, but uh, which is uh, at least for me always important that it's not just a design object or something, but it's always uh, uh, includes information, why it's important, why you do it, and are raising the awareness of, of our, our activity or our uh, cultural heritage, etc. And la last thing I, I wanted to bring out uh, uh, was, uh, it's again a uh, 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 recording of the, of the web page, uh, and uh, um, <coughs> Uh, but during this uh, particular project, we are like more focusing or more interested in uh, uh, application of uh, 3D, uh, 3D modeling uh, in conservation and then the conservation science, but also presentation. And uh, <coughs> Again, uh, for uh, uh, present, uh, 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 certainly for research, it's extremely useful, uh, a useful tool. But also for presentation, uh, presentation purpose, it's a, uh, and then the communication purpose, it's a, a nice uh, thing to uh, use. And here you see, uh, uh, see just. Uh, how it's presented in a web page and how you can compare uh, different artworks. But uh, as a next slide, uh, I wanted to, uh, to show you that's uh, just something no, funny. I want to move. Um, oh, no. Okay, this slide, oh, sorry, doesn't really work. Oh, no, it works. <laughs> uh, but also, uh, it's uh, how you uh, teach uh, people to see the small details. Uh, these are puttos from different churches. They are, uh, they are actually quite tiny, but, but just teaching uh, uh, teaching people not only I, I mean not only a uh, uh, broader public but also also ourselves to see the details to admire the details. Uh, yeah, these are, uh, but uh, and then there are a few slides how we are uh, during this project, uh, how so our research team, uh, we, are, we are carrying out the investigation in, uh, in countryside churches where these uh, uh, artworks are mainly are situating. They are in very, uh, normally in very remote places, but it's also nice to uh, see how the church, which here is. Um, kind of uh, uh, filled with the investigators, but always uh, we uh, try to involve also a local community. Here you see a kindergarten of, of uh, uh, Martna Church, which is somewhere, uh, somewhere in uh, um, Mid-Estonia, or uh, school children from uh, another uh, uh, rural church, or um, uh, uh, or uh, church community. And uh, all those projects are very closely uh, combined with our uh, study programs, uh, which means that it's always carried out uh, uh, together with our students, so they are immediately involved to the real uh, investigation project, and they are, wor uh, they are working closely together with the chemists chemists or, or, or imaging, tech, uh, the imaging specialist. So we are always trying to uh, yeah, involve uh, from beginning on a lot of uh, students' activities. And also in, uh, before in the panel, uh, just seeing this photo in the panel, we had a discussion about this uh, uh, kind of, I don't know, opposition or, or whatever, uh, with uh, uh, curators, for example. But here, uh, in uh, the, those kind of projects, we are very closely combining art, histor uh, art historians and, uh, and uh, conservation students. So from beginning on, they are working together also in, uh, in situ, in the objects. So, the, I mean, uh, the, uh, like that, it's... Uh, I think, at least in Estonian context, uh, we don't have uh, like a kind of uh, this uh, fight for position. Uh, uh, all the student, uh, students, they are from beginning on, they are, they are, I mean, equal in their position or equal in their uh, activities, or professional activities. So these are just a short uh, presentation what we are doing, and then uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Hilke. You are obviously rising that bar even higher now. Um, our next speaker is uh, Patria Noble, Head of Paintings Conservation at the Rijksmuseum. Sure. So let me just put on my glasses. Um, you can hear me? Yeah. So actually, I'm just going to start off by saying something about myself and my background. Um, I was introduced, I, I'm head of paintings conservation at the Rijks Museum, but actually, uh, I think as you all heard, I worked for 18 years as a paintings conservator at the Maritz House in The Hague. Uh, a museum with a, a similar kind of collection, a smaller collection, of course. Um, I had the advantage of working together with Jörn Badem for nine years when I was there. Um, he, he was a tremendous mentor and also a very inspiring person to actually work with. I think that that's a, you know, a huge advantage or luck, whatever you call it, with if you do have the opportunity to find people to work with, that can be very inspiring. And I think depending on your own interests, that is part of the journey. Um, and during all those years at the Maritos, where I eventually also became head of uh, paintings conservation after Jörn left, um, I really honed my skills as a researcher. Uh, the collection was relatively small, not exhibition driven. I had the support of the directors, of the curatorial staff, and it was a wonderful environment to kind of grow and develop. And I had also had particular my own interests in scientific investigations of paintings. I had a strong um, interest and I think an ability to really collaborate with scientists. And I, during the years at the Maritos, I really forged that. I forged collaborations with uh, different universities, University of Antwerp, uh, the Technical University in Delft. We went on in 2012 to apply for a major grant from the Dutch Scientific Organization, which we won um, for developing and the application of non-invasive imaging techniques. And I think it was then around that time you really start to come under the radar of your director and people start to pay attention <laughs> to what you're doing. And then they suddenly realize, oh yes, you've got 50 publications on our paintings. And, you know, and I think it was at a time when things were developing. I mean, I think the curatorial staff, people were aware of the importance of technical studies because they had always supported it. But then I think once you start bringing money into an institution and you start being invited to give talks at international conferences, then you, you, know, you really then gain much more visibility within your organization. Um, and of course, there were always a lot of support for conservation in the Maritos. I mean, even when Jörn was there, there was, of course, the public restoration of uh, Vermeer's Gold with a Pearl Earring. That was actually in 1995. Um, there was also uh, Fabrizio's, Carol Fabrizio's Goldfinch that was actually restored and examined down in the galleries. Um, there was a lot of attention for conservation-related activities. Um, the directors were always coming through with potential sponsors up to conservation. You know, you were always expected to be ready with a three-minute speech to talk about whatever research you were. So you were given a lot of opportunity to actually um, to be visible within the organisation. But it was a relatively small museum, of course, with only about 50 um, you know, staff members compared to the Reichs Museum, which has now 600 plus. So, um, you know, you got to know everyone. And I think that has been mentioned if, uh, numerous times. If you're working in a museum, get to know everyone, get to know the guards, get to know the people in education, get to know the people in development, talk to them at lunch, talk to them at coffee, because it's in those conversations and in that listening that you can make things happen within your organization. Because then you just go by somebody and say, hey, you know, can we do this? Have you thought about that? Is this a possibility? Because that's how actually, you know, things happen. Um, because they're not going to come to you. Everyone is busy. We all know that in a museum, everyone, you know, is working with deadlines and they're not going to come up to you and say, hey, I have a project. <laughs> so, you know, you, to a certain extent, you really have to try and make it happen. Um, and as a result of all those sort of activities, I mean, I, I published a lot. I shared a lot of um, the results with the directors. Um, um, there was one particular painting, a, a late Rembrandt painting, uh, The Saul and David. Uh, I worked on actually for seven years. 
Um, when Emily Gordenka started as a new, our new director in 2008, she had the idea to actually share that with the public. She had the idea to actually make an exhibition about the research. So actually that took place between 2014 and 2015. Epco Runio, who was head of education at the time, was very uh, active in sort of creating the format for the exhibition, how that would be, you know, uh, how we would share that information with the public. You know, there were certain loans related to the painting. And in the end, there were sort of various television screens where there were different dialogues about the art historical aspects or about the technical aspects. And the exhibition actually won a medal for being one of the best, you know, um, exhibitions about uh, technical research of a painting. Now, that was 2015. And now we jump forward to 2019. Um, I've been five years in the Rijksmuseum. Two years ago, we started with the idea of treating the Rembrandt's Night Watch, also an, um, a, you know, a very important Rembrandt painting. Um, probably a year of discussions took place about how that was going to actually take place. It's a very big painting. It measures, it was originally five meters wide. It's now four meters wide by three and a half meters wide. Um, there were all, for a year, ideas were bounced around. And um, I think eventually it became clear that this would all have to happen in the galleries because the painting cannot be taken out of the galleries. It wouldn't be responsible to take it out and uh, not have the, the public accessible to it for so long. So um, July 8th of this year was the official start of that project. Um, for everyone who's probably looked on YouTube and, and Twitter and all the other um, social media canals, you can actually see images of the glass house. Uh, so we have a very beautiful glass enclosure in the gallery. So it's about uh, six or seven meters from the painting. We have a dedicated easel that um, the painting can be moved left, right, up and down and actually uh, forward. Um, we have a dedicated hydraulic platform, or actually two of them, that can be linked close to one another on which we can put all the equipment that we need. At the moment, we've just finished um, macro XRF, uh, XRF scanning of the painting. So that was a total of 56 scans in order to scan the entire surface of the painting. Um, in a month or so, we will begin with high-resolution photography of the painting. So actually, the research phase, which started on July 8th, will continue until May of next year. So this is really the research phase of the painting. I felt very strongly about that there should be a dedicated research phase. And then, uh, based on the research results, we should make an advice to the museum to our International um, Advisory Commission as to what we think should happen to the painting. Um, because it, we cannot make an assessment without uh, enough uh, information, enough data. And I was very happy that finally everyone was on board about that. That was, that was a bit of a struggle. I felt very convinced about that. I feel very uh, positive about that, in essentially for every treatment, that you should separate the research phase from a treatment phase, that you then you can make a comparison for what happens in a hospital, for instance. You know, they first you do it, uh, diagnostic tests, you come with a treatment plan, you discuss it with the patient, you make a decision, and then you move forward with the treatment. So it's, um, uh, the plan at the moment is that in May of next year, we will uh, develop a treatment plan based on the approval of that. Um, we will then probably start with some form of the treatment in the summer of next year. Um, and we don't know how long that will take. But because we have a dedicated setup in the galleries, um, we have a, uh, a dedicated team, what we call the Night Watch team, um, and that team consists of curators, scientists, conservators, photographers. Um, it's about 20 people in total. Um, we meet every week to discuss the data as it becomes available through, uh, at the moment, the macro XRF data. Um, we're, in this way, we're really very closely collaborating with our fellow curators. We have three curators who are part of the Nightwatch team. And so for them, it's a great learning curve in looking at these scans, what does it mean, comparing it to x-rays. Um, so it's a great way of interacting. Uh, we're really learning from one another. You know, we have an imaging scientist in our Nightwatch team 
who is really explaining to us, you know, what is the potential of all this data and how it's all going to be eventually correlated and how we're actually going to uh, develop a neural no network that down the line is actually going to automatically identify all these features we want that we see in a painting. Essentially, that's where, where we're going to go with this. Where we're going to go is artificial intelligence. So essentially, once you've uh, collected all that data, you can then through computer uh, learning, you can actually um, have a computer do part of the work for you. That's not gonna take away the role of the conservator, but it's gonna actually allow, free up some of our time to do other things that are actually, you know, that we need to do as well. So it just sort of gives you some idea. In terms, I just wanna say, of course, what's really important is the whole, um, at the moment, uh, the social media aspect is of course really huge. Um, we spend a lot of our time writing posts for in Instagram, Twitter. Uh, we have an Excel document about all the videos that have to take place in the next couple of months. And that's either about Rembrandt's pigments, about Rembrandt's painting technique, about explaining the, the scientific equipment that's being used. I mean, it's on one hand we can say, well, you know, are we really, is this really what we want to be doing as conservators, you know? But on the other hand, it's a great opportunity, I think, for, for the field, for us as conservators to increase our visibility um, within the museum. So um, it, I think, and together with our uh, marketing and communication department, who are also relatively new to this whole sort of social media you know, um, train, um, we're figuring out a bit as we go. I have uh, recently, um, there are the strategy, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but pitch, play, and plunge. That is social media strategy. So essentially you have to have the pitch that is in the, in the videos that are on YouTube and uh, in, on Twitter. The play is the more interactive uh, thing. Um, and the plunge is actually sort of questions and material that has more content. So we're suddenly sitting in and developing and giving input to our social media department f to develop all these kind of digital assets as part of this project. So it's a huge learning curve for all of us. Um, I think it'll be very interesting. I imagine sort of five years down the line, this will all be commonplace. And then, you know, we don't have to probably put so much energy into it ourselves. But I think we're at a point in time, it's a learning curve. And I think, you know, the field is changing. I think, um, uh, you know, as in terms of the Rijksmuseum, we've been told this is really priority, is, is the social media aspect. And so I think when you've been given that sort of that window of opportunity, when suddenly you're working on such a, an important painting of such status and important, I mean, of course, then you should take that opportunity and, um, you know, take advantage of it for the field, for conservation. It's, a, it's also been a tremendous opportunity. We've been able to hire many scientists. We we've, we've now have a dedicated science department. Um, so it's really a wonderful opportunity for the museum and I think for the field in the Netherlands. Um, we heard a little bit this morning about you know, differences in different countries. So, I mean, we're very fortunate that a few years ago, conservators were brought up on the same pay scale as, as the curators. I think that has a lot to do with our scientific activities of the last 10 years in the Netherlands. I think uh, our directors were very progressive in, um, in realizing that, that we have to be on the same level. So, um, so I think that, is, uh, that has also supported all these activities. Um, and I, I think I uh, just probably wanted to conclude that, you know, in trying to put this all into perspective, I think when you're a young conservator, it's hard to sort of take all this on board because it sort of seems like you have, you know, there's more and more what you need to do. I mean, I sometimes feel like that as a conservator. You know, you've got management and you've got social media and you've got um, scientific investigations that you're part of and scientific projects to manage. But I think you do have to try and look at the bigger picture. And I think that was also said this morning, that you have to understand the different stakeholders who are involved. And by that I mean also, you know, all the different departments in your museum. So if you're, you've got the education department, you've got the development department, you've got the directors, you've got the... Um, 
you know, you've got security department, you've got technical people, you have to talk to these people, you have to understand what is the big picture here, you know. Um, because I think so often as conservatives, you're so focused on making sure the condition of the object is stable. But essentially you also, you have to understand that an object actually has a lifetime, it has a history, and it also has a future. And once you start to understand an object in terms of its lifetime, it's easier to look at priorities and to make priorities, you know, because then what is more important to stabilize this object? Should you be making an intervention if you look into the future and think, well, maybe that intervention is actually going to cause problems in the future? So, I mean, I think it is really important to try and look at uh, the bigger picture of things um, and also to develop relevant skill sets. I think that has always served me really well. I mean, I think. I think the reason why I was actually hired at the Maritos all these years ago was because I was, you know, I was a good microscopist. I knew how to use a microscope. So that set me apart from other people, I think. And I think that was the reason why I was hired. Um, I think what, why I was hired at the Rijksmuseum was partly because of all that collaboration, that scientific collaboration I'd done at the, in the Maritos. That's what they were looking for. Um, so um, I think, you know, if you, you know, try and take a, a broader look, I think that makes you, you're in a much better position to anticipate and meet the needs of your collection and also of your organisation. So I'll finish with that. <laughs> Thank you, Patria. Our next speaker is Ralph Uwe Johan. Okay. Yep. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Ralph Uwe Johan from Defna and Johan, and um, I was invited as a member of the general public. I'm not a conservator, also sometimes running a company 140 years old has some parts of conservation and pre preventive conservation, but that's a different subject. And um, um, I'm happy to share some um, observations, experience from the outside and from a broader angle with you this afternoon. I would like to address the question of um, why actively building a network, and we heard that a couple of times, but I think it's important and it can be repeated uh, to build a network beyond the ecosystem and not just within the ecosystem and why outreach is important and thirdly why conservatives should be on the podium more often and um, we get in touch with conservatives at Defna and Johan every day we place orders and we handle the orders we get requests we we seek advice, and so that is a, a part of our daily routine, and we um, have um, conservators approaching us from many different countries. Like last year, there were more than 50 countries we, we serviced, and, uh, and from all different fields. And this gives uh, a good overview on what is needed and what techniques and practices are in which country as a priority. And um, so that is a part of our routine. And we have, a, we have been working with a conservator in our team for many years. So we actually have a conservator as a staff for senior consulting and for product innovation. But... Um, I would like to put the focus on the network of conservators we are trying to establish for many, many decades, actually, because that is important for us to keep the portfolio fresh, to stay innovative and to have new products in the portfolio. And um, so it's really a, a bouncing back of, of information. And um, in this context, just if you imagine, we have about uh, 200,000 items on stock about 10,000 products in the web shop. This is simply not possible to know it all and to handle it all. And, um, and there's always different angles to look at a certain product. And so um, this kind of um, feedback loop is very important. And um, about six years, six years ago, I came up with the idea of an expert to expert format. Um, at fairs. So it was the idea was to bring the producers of products 
and uh, some researchers, but also conservators to the fair and ask them to interact with the visitors to explain what, what is a product for and to uh, receive feedback, etc. And that was um, a valuable thing. We not only got the senior people, but also young graduates to join us. They came with their project, they had a, a thesis on a certain material, and we said, why don't want to present that at the fair? And um, that was perceived very well. And um, uh, I observed that sharing the knowledge and learn from a broader experience was um, very valuable. And it sometimes helped to overcome prejudices. Why? Because sometimes people with an academic background have a prejudice when it comes to the craftsman and the craftsman vice versa. So there's kind of all subtle um, little vibrations. And uh, when you speak at a fair and when you just discuss and you hear the question and put yourself in the, in the other shoes, that's quite helpful. And um, we, we heard from the young, especially from the young conservators, that that was a, a good contribution to their learning curve, a steep learning curve they took at these fairs. And it was interesting that it changed their view on a couple of things. And uh, so it was um, what we thought a good contribution to, to um, broaden and um, widen their network. And uh, we think to reach out is very beneficial, especially during the, the early years of your career. And don't be hesitant, I can only invite you. I mean, I have never seen anyone got their head chopped off because they asked a question. Um, the only thing is you bite your tongue when you don't ask the question you, and you go home and say, I should have asked her, you know? And this is a great platform. Actually, everyone here is uh, already privileged in a way being more proactive. So, I mean, just use the time if you try to speak to someone. And, um, actively connecting and uh, in that context I would really encourage you not just within your peers and the peer group but also to reach out and uh, speak to other professions, speak to other peoples and, um, and I think that is, and you can learn from other disciplines among your friends. I mean, I tell you, you do project management, it's done in other disciplines as well. I know car manufacturers do project management and building constructors. And some of them do it since 50 years and they are pretty smart at it. So there is good, sources to learn from. And don't invent it and reinvent it over and over and over again. Um, just take what has been successful somewhere else, copy it, and use it for yourself. And um, is outreach important? A question which was asked. I think it absolutely is. Uh, conservation still is not familiar to a broader public. And I'm really surprised. Uh, but that's a fact. If you do not present your profession, others might do. And um, there may be room for, politely said, misinterpretation. So um, my, my personal um, um, experience is we often invite conservators to present at groups. And um, I once um, had a conservator present at the Neue Museum in, in Berlin. Um, and they, they presented how they translated Chipperfield's architectural blueprint into the real substance and it was a range of aspects of design and the materials chosen, the techniques that had been applied and the um, relation to the object shown and the historic context the building was in, etc. And the funny thing was it was a group of like 20 people and they were doctors and lawyers, etc. And they were stunned. And they said, I never spend a time in a museum without looking so little at the objects. So they just learned about the, the structure and, and, and they ask, where did you all learn that? And, and, um, and so there, there, was really, um, there was really no idea that there's a university degree for that. And for me, it was striking. And I said, we have to go out more and explain what we actually do, me as a part of the ecosystem. But I would like to encourage you to do the same. And um, we do invite artists on a regular basis from Europe. Um, and give them the opportunity to speak to conservators at our company. And this is an established thing from, from Riga, from Oslo, from, from like Norway, from Greece, from England. And uh, the interesting thing is the conservators explain preventive conservation, art handling, aging, and all these kind of things. And the artists very much appreciate it. And, they, um, and sometimes they actually reconsider their their material choices and, and practices because of the feedback or the evaluation of this discussion. So there, there is multiple ways to actually present your work in the, in the, broader, in the broader public. And um, what 
I would finally like to um, refer to is the importance to present and to engage with the public to elaborate the value and the relevance of conservation and preservation. And um, there's a lot of theory about it. Like at, if you look at the um, Wanda document, it's, it's, it clearly says we have to go out, we have to do PR, and, um, and outreach is a part of the program. And it's so important we have to educate the public on what we do. And, um, but still, I think theory is there, everyone understands. Just do it, like Nike says. And uh, so um, this, this, um, this requires presentation skills and the willingness to present in front of a public and to ask for feedback. And I can only, as my um, pre-speaker said, I can only encourage you to, to do it, to practice it. The first presentation feels a little bit harder than the second, and after the tenth, you are an expert. And um, so you are exactly at this point of your career where you can practice to do so. And um, this is, I think, a great opportunity. And uh, just finally, let me bring your attention to some economic figures, since I have a business and IT background. Um, the art market, according to Art Basel and UBS, uh, in 2018 was $67.4 billion, also 67 milliarden. US dollar, and it grew over 10 years with a rate of 3 to 9 percent, depending on the study you look at, etc. Um, and it employed about 3 million people, and there is some more details on this study. Um, the awareness or the point I want to make, and I know these sums sound enormous, and they can they are difficult to translate into conservation budgets, but um, I would argue that no collector buying a piece of art wants to see this being damaged or in decay. So if that is like a hypothesis, then there must be a broader market. And if, if, if you look at these huge sums that are generated in, in something that is kind of disconnected from the conservation world, I think there must be ways to connect it. And um, so, I would like to invite you, I, I don't know what the best or the first or the second step would be to, to go about that, but I, I think there are ways. And um, interestingly enough, um, I think the second largest investment are in China, from that sum. Germany is a little, very small. And uh, the interesting thing is that the overall age group is 50 and above, but in China, it's millennials investing. It's younger people, different education background, um, so, go to China. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I don't know what the conclusion could be. That's another session. But um, um, in this context, um, I, I think that um, there is um, there's a good opportunity. And I spoke to collectors, and some of the collectors are surprisingly uninformed. And I discussed with one collector for for beautiful, um, a very substantial collection of, of um, graphical art and, 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 and I asked him how much, how much money did you spend last year on preventive conservation? And, um, and then I asked him again, I said, did you spend more money on your car service or on preventive conservation? And the answer was on the car. And I think it's stupid because a car pretty much depreciates in, in a year rate, whereas his arts is not. So that is kind of a, a bridge uh, we, ever, we all need to, we need to gap. And um, so conservators benefit too little from the economical um, situation of, of this market. And um, this is just fine arts, uh, contemporary or modern art, but it's also in cultural heritage. This is also a big sector with big uh, investment. And um, I, I think there are ways other Industry disciplines have gone the way. If you look at the car manufacturers, if you look at dentists, they made service model in preventive care, uh, something you're willingly to pay for. And that wasn't 30 years ago, that wasn't the case. And today, if you just go to the garage and they say, you yeah, need to check this and this and this, uh, and you accept it, you know, and the same with dentist treatments, at least. Um, so this is a a similar situation, uh, and we could take some learning from that. And don't get me wrong, there's nothing you can cut and paste, but uh, it's just the idea of stimulating some um, discussing. So um, 
A critical thing, again, is um, explaining context, relevance, and the value of conservation work. Um, otherwise, the um, stage is left to others. And um, there are excellent examples. We've heard of examples in the panel before and now. And I would very much encourage you to just own the stage. Thank you. Thank you, Ralph Uva. And now I'd like to call our final speaker, Issa von Lenten. So this is one of my first presentations, not in presenting a project that I've done at university. <laughs> Most of us here present use social media, some more, some less. We take more and more advantage of social media, not just to stay in contact with our friends all over the world, but also to gather general information on, for example, society and politics. We can also use it to exchange and spread our knowledge and views on various fields. Being part of special interest groups on Facebook or following certain hashtags on Instagram gives us, in addition to general world news, our very own on our needs adapted information. This applies to every interest group. We also use social media to discuss about topics we are interested in, to share our opinion with whoever wants to read or see it, and to push what we like or dislike. Should we, professionals of conservation and restoration of cultural heritage, use this opportunity of social media to represent our field, to use it as a publicity platform? What are the benefits and what are the drawbacks of being in the public eye? The Instagram account of IIC, that some of you might hopefully know and follow, was started one and a half years ago. And I really think it is achieving what we hoped for. We have nearly 4,000 followers, and a lot of people from everywhere are invited to send images which to be shared on the platform. 80% of the followers are women, 20% men, and the average age range is between 25 and 34 years old. Many of the followers are conservation students, emerging conservators, and conservation experts, but there are also museum workers, artists, art historians, and people of other fields that are interested in our work. Some of my non-conservation friends follow the account and tell me how fascinated they are to have a little, little insight in what we do. In preparation to this conference, I asked several very short questions in the Instagram stories feature. And the questions included, for example, can our profession be represented in social media? And also, is outreach important for us? Around 130 followers answered both questions with yes. And only eight said no. No, it cannot be represented. Even though only a very small group of people answered the two questions, it is noticeable that there seems to be the wish to represent conservation on social media, to ensure that conservation is recognized and seen. There are several reasons why we should do so. Publicity will raise awareness for our field and therefore more acknowledgement will be gained. And this is what we aim for. We want to invite the public to see more of what we do, to more and more understand our work and the ethical messages we try to spread. But as the organizing committee wrote in their description of this session, Conservators are often shown as skilled artists, passionate art and heritage lovers, and hobbyists, and less as scientists or postgraduate level professionals. By spreading well-founded information, we have to try to change this, to raise awareness, extend the audience for conservation, and create new interest and support. This will hopefully also affect the path to get conservation to be a protected profession, which is not yet the case in many countries. Especially on a platform where you just upload an image or a little text, anybody can claim to be a professional of conservation. Another big benefit of using these platforms in our profession is the contact to and exchange between professionals of every age. Not only young professionals are present on social media, but also more experienced experts. There are numerous groups in which you will find engaged discussions about materials and techniques that are used, or where people just simply ask where to buy this and that material. 
Unfortunately, these platforms are also often used to criticize what materials others have used or what treatment they have done. It is easy to judge very fast and difficult to fully explain a choice on the base of just one image, video or small text. It therefore is very important to always explain the posted content as accurately and informed as possible and wanted. So we can see that with, with raising awareness also comes risk. Risk to show our profession in a wrong light. For example, when cases of unprofessional conservation treatments, which do not always correspond with what our profession stands for or our work ethic, go online and viral. Also, so seen beautiful before and after treatments, uh, transformations of artworks are shown, which can lead to misinterpretation that conservation means to make art beautiful and shiny again. These cases do increase the visibility of our profession and the awareness, but not always in a way we would like it to be increased. So are these cases still a profit for us because they raise awareness, or is it only a downside as we do not want to have any publicity but the right publicity? I personally think that using social media is a good step to improve knowledge about the great field of conservation and restoration. We have to be careful not to expect to be able to give a full insight into our, into our profession. We can, of course, not simply explain it in some pictures, but we can create a platform to inform followers, exchange with colleagues, and to bring the techniques and aims of conservation closer to an external audience. I would like to close with three questions, favors to ask you. Whoever is on Instagram but is not yet following IIC Conservation or Young Conservatives or Fun Conservatives or all these amazing uh, accounts, please follow and let's stay connected. And if you have any image that you would like to share with the IIC account followers, just send it through the IIC Instagram account or to insta at iconservation.org and I'll be happy to share it. And as I'm still doing it on my own and I would love to have some help, um, I would like to ask if there's anybody who would be interested in running it with me. And it would be great if it is maybe someone from somewhere totally different and from a different field than paintings, because I feel that I'm very much concentrating on painting and Northern European images. So it would be great to have the opportunity to sh show a great, um, wider range of content. If, yeah, if so, then just talk to Graham or Amber or me. <laughs> Thank you. I told you we were going to have an incredible panel, and it's been wonderful to see that through each of the sessions thus far, this idea of public engagement keeps kind of percolating up through the conversation. So we're hoping you have many great questions. So where should we begin? This one in the back. Hello, me again. <laughs> so my question is about um, regulating the perception of conservation on social media. And I think it's something that everybody has sort of touched on this public kind of perception of our profession. And it's something that Issa, you touched on in your talk. Um, but do you think it's time that we establish as a profession some rules, some guidelines on how we display ourselves on conservation, that there's some way to control? Because I feel like um, from the things that I've seen on YouTube especially, that there can be um, a lot of misinformation and also some vitriol from fellow conservators who are criticizing each other. And perhaps a way of controlling that would be by establishing guidelines for the profession and perhaps that way we would be less inclined to start judging or like um, saying, remark, remarking on each other's work and perhaps negatively. That maybe it'd be nicer if it was a more positive space that we could share ourselves positively like that. 
Well, I'm going to just jump in here just as a um, social media editor for the IIC. We actually do have guidelines. And even in our community platform where we have the open discussion, we do invite people to please follow those guidelines. And at times, we do need to mediate and step in. We haven't had it yet on our community platform. But I know on other platforms, uh, most, inst most places that are running these are trying very hard to put community guidelines in place. And, and basically a way of, of communicating with one another. But I'd be curious as, you know, with, with like Patria, with your project, is there someone who is monitoring that or providing those guidelines of di discussion? Well, I think as I said, you know, our um, marketing and communication digital group uh, is a relatively new group and there have already been a number of issues. Um, for instance, I think one of the remarks on Twitter once was, who's the cute guy? <laughs> They're referring to one of the, you know, one of the new sort of researchers, and then somebody responded like, "Oh, you can you can check out his contacts on the Rijksmuseum page." So I mean, we found that this was really, um, you know, <laughs> not not acceptable. Yes. So, um, and also in terms of content, I mean, um, you know, we've been involved in sort of deciding what we think is relevant content, you know, uh, pigments being used by Rembrandt or painting technique. Um, but the social media department has a very much a sort of an idea of what they consider to be an accessible text. Um, it's at the moment, it's still this sort of back and forth. It actually takes up too much time until we come into a sort of a format that we think there's a, you know, sufficient content. Usually for an Instagram post, it's a hundred words and a strong image. So, I mean, uh, I think, you know, I'll be interested actually to look at the AIC guidelines. Um, so maybe we actually we can use, use that. But like I said, I mean, it's, it's a still a relatively new thing that we're trying to figure out. Um, but it's clear that guidelines are, are needed. One thing I found that was really interesting is I was once interviewed by the National Public Radio Station um, in my labs and walking through, and there's sort of a live broadcast going on. And at the same time, there were a lot of what they call trollers going on, who were obviously looking for these live broadcasts and then saying really terrible things, um, judging people that were presenting and saying things. But then I noticed that it was afterwards, even though these are recorded sessions, NPR went through and sort of culled out those inappropriate comments. And I find that in, I, I've seen a few times in um, our own sector that when that does happen, there are some people who even professionals making inappropriate comments who get very upset that their inappropriate comment was taken down, which is another whole thing. We could go down that rabbit hole. Um, but I think for the, for the sake of, of projects, it's, it's, it, it's, we're starting very broad and open, trying to be accessible. And we learn just as you do in any litigious type society, you know, when you then start having to control and put guidelines in and having to, to figure it out. So it's, it's ever growing, but I, I, think that, I think we're going to continue to evolve in that sense in how we monitor ourselves. But it, it's a real important point to me, remain civil and open and yet allow many voices to be heard because the minute criticism comes into play, many voices get quiet and that, that defeats the purpose. Another question? Yes. Hello. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you had any opinions on, um, not so much on the social media space, but when it comes to relating to more traditional print-based media. Uh, so where, where I used to work in Denmark, uh, I did have an interview with a, with a local newspaper that unfortunately distilled the nuance I was trying to get across down to a, a very handy grabbing headline that was not representative of our profession. Um, whereas when I was in my first year of training, I was instructed not to give any details on our profession at all in case people try and imitate it. I was just wondering where you stood on the balance between getting across what we do in a detailed way um, or sort of holding back and keeping it a bit more mysterious but at the risk of, of oversimplifying and losing that nuance. Well, Hilke, I think you would be a fabulous person to answer that question with the tremendous amount of outreach you've done and public eye. And could you speak to that a little? Yes. Uh, um, 
Oh, no, it's fine, yeah? Okay. Yeah, uh, actually, it's, uh, it's uh, just uh, before the presentation, I was thinking uh, a bit about this because we are always talking about the positive side of public communication, etc., and the importance, etc., etc. But uh, it has also a critical moments, and then uh, especially because uh, uh, somehow in Estonia, it's also due to, due to the fact that Estonia is so small, and we are like not all, uh, but our discipline is constantly in media, but uh, not in social media only, but but constantly in, in whatever written media and official media, and it's always almost like a must uh, at least once per week uh, somebody has to speak about conservation, and then, but exactly that it uh, also has a kind of uh, uh, critical moments. Uh, first, exactly the simplification of the things and how to find the balance uh, that uh, uh, you have to do it, certainly, because if you are talking with the, uh, with the general public, uh, you have to kind of uh, simplify the things, but it's still, if the professional is reading sometimes or listening the text, uh, and then uh, you uh, often don't control what they put exactly the title, what you see afterwards, and what is it, and so on, so on. So it's not so easy to find a balance between our <laughs> profession and then and, and this uh, uh, kind of uh, public communication. And it's no recipe, and, and I don't know, it's uh, just... Uh, at least what we try, uh, I tried always to, uh, when it's a uh, written uh, uh, media, to get the article beforehand to read it. But, but uh, it's, uh, and also the tendency I was thinking, uh, as uh, some, I, I don't know, it's many reasons why it uh, became so popular in Estonia like last year, and, and uh, it's like uh, really a must to be in, in a TV. Or, uh, and, um, it's also like a kind of, uh, we are not searching any more attention, but, but it's, uh, we are not making a, 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 a whatever, um, this press releases, or, but, but the media is searching a news. And then the, and the con conservatives are giving a news. It's always like something, mm -hmm. so it, uh, yeah, I uh, no, uh, no uh, uh, good answer, but certainly it is uh, not so easy to find a balance between this. Maybe yeah. I can yeah. also add. Of course, in, you know, in, a, in most large museums, you have a, um, you know, a, a, a marketing communication department that actually has guidelines. So usually whenever you give an interview, it goes through them. Um, so, you know, if you're dealing with sensitive material, like for instance now with the Nightwatch project, we have to really discuss beforehand what kind of results are we releasing and what are we sort of saving. So it's actually being, you know, there's a sort of, it's being, um, you know, dosed in a way, you know, that we're, it's possible to actually release this image for Instagram, right. but yet, you know, we, will, we won't release everything at, the, at this moment. Um, so there's lots of discussions about that kind of thing. I've given interviews where I've been completely happy about the content, but then suddenly the headline, which you were not informed about, is, you know, completely outrageous, you know? Um, and that, unfortunately, you don't have any control about because they often don't. They, I think the head editors sort of decide on sometimes the title of, of these articles and then nobody knows about it until it comes out. So even the article can be great, but the headline can be <laughs> yeah. I was provocative. Gonna, <laughs> I was going to say, from from my museum's perspective, um, being the visible lab, you know, we do get a lot of interviews, and our public relations department is a really important part of vetting through who comes through to speak to us and and making sure that the, the timing is right and the content is there um, where they can. They offer to pre-read the article to make sure the technical information is accurate. Um, sometimes you, you just you can't get around it. There's gonna, they're going to end up publishing it. Uh, however, we often will leave them takeaway sheets with critical information and definitions. Sometimes helps um, to help guide them in the way that they write about conservation. Um, we've learned that through the years that it's been very helpful to provide them with the language they can use um, to help describe that we're conservators, not conservationists. You know, terminology being, nothing makes me cringe more when I'm a conservationist. <laughs> and oddly enough, there is a woman by the name of Amber Kerr who is a conservationist who graduated in, in the west coast of America and she and I are become very fast friends over the last 12 years. It's very interesting. Um, actually in Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know, we use the word restorer usually, and then, of course, the word restaurator, mm. restaurateur, actually also appears in the press, which actually means somebody who's in charge of a restaurant. Hey, Ralph Hoover, we're back to the conversation we had last night about restaurants, aren't yeah, we? Yeah, yeah. And there was, a great, there was a great cartoon that appeared up just shortly after the Nightwatch project uh, was announced, and it was actually this couple sitting behind their computer looking at a cafe, and in the, in the cafe was, uh, you know, the restorers working on the painting. <laughs> So it was a kind of a cute joke. It was a cute joke, but. Hi, do we have another question? Here we go, right in the front. Uh, just a quickie. Uh, I'm new to conservationism. <laughs> uh, I just want to know: is there is there a rule with about the technical questions that, which you cannot share with public? Is is there actually something you cannot say? because I felt that there are things and pictures of the objects in the museum that I cannot put on Instagram, for example. I just feel that I can't. Copyright is a really important thing to think about in anything that you share. Do you have the right to share this image? Is it, is it open source information that you can provide? Is this image, it may be a great image, but if you don't have the copyright to share it, and you really need to check that out. And that, that is actually a huge pitfall right now, I think, in anything with social media and postings, um, because it's so easy to just take a photograph and post it up, and exciting and lovely, and, and then at the same time you find out that you have no right to do that. That is not your artifact, it's got copyright attached to it. So being really acutely aware of copyright and the copyright laws, and they are changing all the time. It is, it is really difficult. We have someone on our social media team who just helps us try and monitor the copyright issues. And then with what's going on in Brexit and the IIC being in London and how is that going to affect what we're doing? I mean, copyright is a really important, and that's beyond just the, the technical, do you want to share this information about the artwork itself, and the, such as with the Night Watch and, the, and what's going on with how much do we share. Um, but these are some critical things that should be measured before just quickly putting something up, I think. And I think um, safety and security is another important um, aspect to be aware of. Mm -hmm. You know, so um, that's something that I think, you know, should always be in your mind. Um, so, I mean, you don't want to sort of raise questions that might come up as a result of, you know, um, you know an image being captured, which may be a situation that doesn't look safe, or for instance, so you really have to make sure that uh, that everything is really, that the setup is really clear, that there are no compromising situations or, uh, you know, so, you know, it does take a lot of um, care and diligence to make sure that everything's in place. And for the Instagram, I always make sure that the object is not seen. Like, there's always just an angle so that you cannot fully see what object it is. And then there's st still, of course, you have to have the permission to show the person itself, so I always get the permission of the person that I post and try to not show the object. One of the things I found also very interesting when, when you brought up the idea of safety um, is you are, are, as a person in this photograph, are they wearing gloves, are they wearing eye protection, are they wearing are they wearing the coat? Are they wearing the apron? You know, what is what is appropriate if they're if they're near X-ray equipment? You know, what do we need to show? Um, there's a level of responsibility. And, and in a previous work that I did, I used to have to. I was in marketing before I entered conservation. Whenever we did a photograph, we were always checking. It was for um, a major corporation, and we had to make sure we were following OSHA laws safety laws within our own country. Are they on a platform that's above six feet and are they harnessed off the way they're supposed to? I mean, these, you don't think about all these things, but it's not just a snap and go kind of thing. It's, 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 they say the easiest things actually have a lot of complication behind them. And I think that's the case. It looks like a great shot, but there's probably a lot of people involved in the choice of what that shot actually looked like. Yes. yes. Uh, question to Petria and Hilka. Do you, I mean, I was deeply impressed by all of your projects uh, and it raised to me the question whether it sometimes develops a self dynamics which uh, in itself becomes frightening. So saying it was good to the ghost that we were calling in, we can't get rid of. So have you had such situations already that uh, you, 
experience this self dynamics or I, I could for example imagine that there's an enormous expectation now by the public that you do all the examination of the night watch now for months and that to prepare the conservation treatment do you think that puts a certain pressure on you to do also a certain treatment although you don't know yet whether any treatment is required at all I'm not so much concerned about that. I think um, it's, it's more the day-to-day, -day, you know, the, that uh, we're in the gallery seven days a week. So we, you know, we have a large team. So essentially, you know, everyone is sort of rostered in. Um, so, you know, it, it really, there's a lot of demand about, you know, exactly, you know, we have a certain time window. Each scan takes 21 hours. We know we have exactly two and a half hours to set up a scan. You have to troubleshoot the whole time. You're under a lot of pressure to set up that scan. Sometimes the software breaks down five times. Um, you, so you're constantly under a lot of pressure to kind of troubleshoot the situation. Um, I'm not so much concerned about down the line about the conservation treatment. I think we have enough time built in to kind of really assess what is going to be the nature of the treatment. We may decide, okay, we're going to start with some structural treatment, or maybe we're going to decide that we need more time for research. I, I think that all those possibilities are possible. So I don't feel that kind of pressure. I think we, what we do feel a lot of pressure is that the public doesn't always understand what is actually going on. And there have been decisions made within the museum about the kind of information that's put on the wall, the kind of information that's in all the social media, they're very conscious about make, not making the information too complex. Sometimes that doesn't do justice to what we're doing. There's a lot of frustration sometimes by the scientists that they feel that the information is too simple. That, um, that when they go out into the galleries, they're bombarded by the public who are saying what's going on. You know, because we don't have a big television screen on the wall in the galleries that's explaining what's going on. You know, we have text on the wall. We have an ask me person in the gallery who's walking around and people can ask them what's going on. But these are very much uh, decisions that have been taken by our exhibition department, by our education department, by our directors, not by us. Um, so these are things we have to do deal with and how we're dealing with that at the moment is that we're constantly evaluating the situation. So every three months the, a memo is sent to DT with an evaluation of how it's going so that we can then kind of make a suggestion that we think we need to improve the situation or we think we need to have more information on the wall. There's, you know, we're constantly bombarded by people every time we come out of the glass house. People want wants to know or they want to know what's going on behind the, the door where we go in and have meetings. That's what they want to know. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of things sometimes that you can't anticipate, you know. Um, and of course, the public has, you know, you, you have, you know, the public, that's a very general term, you know, some people have a lot of knowledge about uh, uh, scientific processes and other people have just more simple questions like, you know, does that machine clean the painting automatically? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, we've even had that. <laughs> so, I mean, because they don't read the text on the wall or, you know, so, I mean, th there's a lot of, that kind of thing to deal with. It's, um, and I think that's quite demanding because you have to do a kind of 180 switch between being really highly focused on your work in, in, in this, on, with the painting and then having to kind of you know, think, well, how, you know, what's going on here? Is it really, how could we improve the situation? Yeah, I can say from the Lender Center, uh, being that we don't have an eventual project that's being taken down, we will always be in view of the public. One of the most important things that have been a success for us is that we have a program coordinator, an individual who is our interpreter and our liaison with other departments. As you mentioned, these other departments are really important, education and curatorial and uh, even the design department. It's like having all these individuals with their expertise come and help you do the, present the project and put their input and their perspective. And, uh, and allowing their expertise to be a part of the project is really important. But for us, having that, that program coordinator, that liaison to the public who is interpreting what we do, 
frees us up a little bit from that, from what you've spoken about, but it, it really is helpful, and, and she's a great asset to us, um, helping us to be able to do our work without being interrupted, and yet knowing that the messages that we have, uh, which we all clearly work with her on, um, are, are spoken about in the right way, um, and the responsibility of that. So. I think with every marketing channel, you have to be clear how much investment it takes, and not just the initial investment, but also maintain it, and maintain it professionally. I mean, you have large organizations behind you, but many restorers don't have that. They don't have a marketing and PR department. It's a one or just a few people show. So I think it's very much a decision you have to make. Um, do I want to be, in which channel I want to present my work, and can I follow up? And also, is it authentic? Because, I mean, if, if you are not willing to spend the time on generating content on a, real, on a regular basis, these things are dead horses. And, uh, and so I, I think it's, it, if, you, if, you, if you struggle with capacity and budgets, you know, it is something you can revert and you can ask your organization if you want to be on that platform, what are the resources you're going to give? How can we professionalize on that? And, um, and these are answers you have given in your organization, but I think these are um, left open in some of the, the museums I'm, I've been working with over the last year. So I think there's a good side and it can leverage a lot of good information, but it also, on the other hand, um, it needs to be considered from a budget uh, and capacity standpoint. Sorry. Hilke, go ahead. <laughs> And I then we'll take a question from the uh, media. I had a comment on, on Gunnar's question, uh, which is another, a little bit another as aspect, which I also realized during all this communication uh, uh, thing, that uh, somehow the expectation that, that the good conservation project, or conservation project is good only when it's communicated, and sometimes the will to ask that, uh, uh, who asked yesterday if you can just uh, make a conservation project without communication, but, uh, but uh, somehow, yeah, it's, uh, it's everybody is expecting that, uh, that you have to do it, and then you are kind of, you just, I mean, it's, you are not successful if you, uh, if you t just make a good conservation without communicating, without speaking, without being in media. And so this is another aspect a little bit which I uh, realize in Estonia at least, that uh, it's, this expectation for communications are too high somehow, or too dominant. And okay, and I think we have a question on the social media. Yeah. Um, Anna from Cologne is asking, what is your opinion on using catastrophes like the fire in Notre Dame or the crash of the Cologne archive back in 2009 to raise the public awareness and popularity of our profession? I think from those particular instances, I'd say I take the word popularity out <laughs> <laughs> and say the necessity for the care of cultural heritage. And this is where, you know, when we talk about the fire in Brazil, um, which, you know, you have all of this attention that was given to Notre Dame, which, you know, was a beautiful cultural heritage place, but then you lost 95% of a collection. I mean, think about that. 95% of a collection was lost in that fire in Brazil, and they have not seen a tenth of the response that Notre Dame received. So the importance, I think, really falls into things like that. And responses, I, I just spent two weeks in Puerto Rico, responding to a hurricane that happened two years ago, and they're still trying to raise money and awareness to the cultural heritage that was lost and damaged from a hurricane two years ago. So I think that there is something there. There is a, a cultural responsibility in, in what our jobs are to get out there and to assist these communities and to raise awareness to these issues in a responsible way. Um, and and it's, it's just interesting to see the, the way different situations are responded to in different ways, but I'd, I'd be curious to hear all of your comments as well. Uh, um, just uh, as, um, so, yeah, in Estonia we had uh, two, three years ago a big tragedy when one of the uh, Orthodox churches burned down old Orthodox churches in one uh, remote island and uh, that was a big uh, tragedy uh, uh, and because uh, the many icons remained in but uh, many were also uh, saved during the fire and then um, that was uh, uh, um, in uh, different conservation and heritage institutions, uh, uh, a huge discussion that is it uh, 
the case uh, uh, to uh, communicate or ho how we communicate the event and if it's uh, possible to communicate to the public uh, to uh, make them more aware of the values and understanding the values and also to uh, um, raise money for conservation and I think it was very successful in the sense that, that uh, uh, it was really well done the communication organized by mainly by, by our heritage board and that was a good example when you can say that the tragedy could be also ha could have also a positive feedback and, and uh, the, the, in the end actually uh, many of these uh, icons uh, were, uh, were uh, or the conservators were able to uh, uh, also to restore and then uh, to make a, a, a nice treatment but it was actually uh, due to the uh, communication and uh, due to the money uh, uh, of, of uh, ministers uh, ministries and 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 uh, in this case i would say that the tragedy could be also a way of communicating our profession. When I often get uh, questions in the tours at my museum, um, one of them is about these disasters that have happened. And you know, we always have this caveat, well, it depends on how we respond, how we talk about things. But this idea of saving cultural heritage, and I use two examples in the United States. You know, There was Hurricane Katrina back in 2005 when I entered graduate school. And I was so proud of my graduate school for taking in artworks from that community because it was so important for that community to feel that they had somehow survived the hurricane and that their, their cultural heritage was being treated and returned to them and the wonderful stories about that and then the outreach from the American Conservation Institute where they went out and they helped people to know how to care for their photographs and their personal heritage, their family heritage that had been damaged in this hurricane. A wonderful story there. And then there's the tragedy of 9-11 and the artwork that was damaged, there was a sculpture that was uh, crushed by the towers when they came down. And that sculpture, when it was removed from the rubble, was, was brought out to Battery Park in Manhattan, and it was left there, exactly the way that it had been damaged. And so in that case, do you restore that piece to what it was before this disaster, or does it now be carry a historic significance? And that's a unique opportunity to really talk about how what happens to an artwork becomes a part of its history. And these are, these are cultural tragedies that can happen to artwork, but using them as teachable moments, if you will, to help the public understand there's not just one way of approaching the conservation treatment of something or the response to something, that there is a responsibility there and that we give careful thought and communication with, with many other professionals into the approach of that and how we preserve the cultural heritage and the history that comes with that cultural heritage. No, I think that I think that's a very good point. Um, I think in the Netherlands, I, uh, I think that there is not a lot of perception by the public of what actually conservation is all about. You know, and also that has a lot sometimes a little bit to do with the fact that we often use the word restoration rather than the word conservation. Um, you know, we're trying to sort of change that, and I think with all the media attention for the Night Watch, I really hope that that is really going to sort of make make a, a paradigm switch with the public, also with the newspapers. Um, I don't know how many interviews I've given about, you know, conservation treatments, and the only thing really that people are interested in is like before and after treatments and how yellow was the varnish and. Have you ever made a mistake? Have you ever damaged a painting? You know, these are the sort of questions you get asked over and over again where you really want to share a lot more of the nuances about what it is you're doing or about preservation aspects or about aging, about degradation, about changes that have taken place over time. You know, because um, these are, you know, the important aspects of, uh, of, of what we do. So I hope that with all this effort that we're putting into you know, this project, that there will be uh, an important shift within the public, that there will be a greater understanding of what goes on behind the scenes um, and that our visibility gets raised. It's already raised within the museum in which we work. Now, when I walk into the museum, people know who you are. <laughs> so that in itself is a, is, you know, is, is a good thing. So. Um, yeah. um, I hope it's not a very difficult question, but 
<laughs> do you think uh, what's the relevance of the public participation and knowledge about uh, conservation and restoration for the building of our own professional identity? Is it relevant? So you're asking the relevancy of, of outreach or? Uh, yeah, and, and how the public can participate or not and how much the, the public knows about uh, what we do. Is it relevant for our own definition? Because as I said earlier, as, as you all know, uh, the, the profession is not very well uh, defined and established. Uh, so how can the public help or not? Yeah. Well, I think there was a little bit of what the, the point I was trying to make, you know, in, in my last point, that at least in the Netherlands, um, the Dutch press, for instance, isn't that well informed, you know. So if you do an interview, what the first question is, what's new? You know, it's, it's kind of... So, you know, you really have to often think it through before you give an interview because you have to think, well, what you know, what is really the point that I want to make here or... You know, how am I going to sell this subject to this person? Or, um, you know, it, it, it's not just about talking about, you know, actually what you're doing on the painting. I think that is important itself. You know, your enthusiasm for what you do is, is it's always important to be authentic about what, whatever it is that you do. And I think that that's important to bring across in an interview. But I mean, it is, uh, it, I think it does vary from country to country. And I, I know this when we treated, for instance, the full length uh, portraits of uh, Martin and Opion, you know, that was 2016, 2018. And then during our, um, uh, the press events where there was a lot of French press, you know, the questions coming from the French press were actually quite different to the questions coming from the Dutch press. So uh, I thought that that was actually very interesting. They had much more detailed questions, a much greater understanding about degradation and changes. And I thought that was actually interesting. You know, if I start talking about metal soaps or changes, or then people's eyes start to glaze over often when you're talking, you know, to the press. So, but it's, um, I, th I mean, it is important, I think, to engage with the public. Um, but that can be in many, many different ways. It doesn't actually have to be on social media. Uh, one of the successful things we did two years ago is um, we were doing, uh, we used our macro XRF scanner and we were scanning paintings in the galleries, you know, during visiting hours. And we had them, you know, it uh, cordoned off so, you know, the public could watch from a safe distance. And they, uh, every afternoon at three o'clock, we had 15 minutes where, you know, the public could ask us questions. And we could say a little five minute spiel about what was happening. And that was hugely successful. So it's, um, it can be in many different ways that you engage with the public. And I think, as I said earlier, it's very important because at a certain, at a certain point, it's a budgeting question. And if you can't explain the value, then it, you are in, in a difficult um, situation because then the allocation of a budget is, um, especially when you are in a political environment, when, when the museum is, is run and owned by a, by a city or by a state, you know, then you're competing with a kindergarten or you, you, you're competing with a, a sports team, whatever. And uh, so you have to be clear on, on the contribution you give. And, and that's why I think it is, it is important not just to focus on the work, but also to find ways to, to explain the value. I, I would go so far to say is that it is extremely essential, especially moving forward. In the world we live in, there's no way that you can avoid it in some ways. And what the most important thing I think to do is to think of it responsibly and making sure your messaging is appropriate, but that you really need to embrace the fact that this is the new reality, this is the now, <laughs> as Jane was saying yesterday, but it, it's not a bad thing either. I think that you know we can't expect that there are people who are gonna advocate for us if we don't advocate for ourselves, and the only way that the messages are gonna be right is if we make those messages ourselves. So it's an important part of what we do, and unless you want someone to define who you are and what you do, you better play a pretty active role in, in what that messaging is about and, and what people hear and what they experience. Another question? Here we have a question down here and then we'll go to the back. So here. Uh, 
Hi, uh, hi I'm Lisa from Australia. Um, in Australia, we've got a museum, the Australian Centre for the Moving Image. It's just about to, it's building a lab, a glass lab for conservators to work in. It's the first one in Australia. So I was just wondering if you could maybe talk a bit more about how conservators feel and deal with working in that kind of environment and um, how you might measure the successes such as have you seen an increase in public interest or understanding of the role of conservation through having the glass system? Yes, 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 yes. It's been amazing. Um, as I said, it was interesting to see the fears from our colleagues before this lab, the Lunder Center, opened. But since then, it's been a great honor, actually, to, to advocate for my field, to increase outreach and knowledge. Um, and because we have full, full to ceiling to floor glass walls, it actually avoids that window thing where people are like, you know, it's actually less distracting. I mean, we work in our labs and people move through our labs and we're able to concentrate on our projects. But, you know, when you have a glass wall, it's just like that. They're just on the other side, but they're not disrupting you. You actually are able to get your work done. Now, I will say two important things that I bring up about the Lunder Center is, Number one, that interpreter that I spoke of, the, the program coordinator, is a real important part of our outreach and um, uh, expressing who we are to the public. And she will go out when she sees people standing by the glass and engage with them and talk with them, or even the conservators, if they have a moment where they can step out, that always thrills the public when we actually stop what we're doing and go out and tell them. Um, <laughs> but that level of responsibility and messaging, being clear about it and the responsibility of having those glass walls. Um, the other thing that's unique about our museum is we don't open to the public till 11.30. And we're one of the later museums on the Smithsonian Mall. And so we actually have a period of time during the day where I can work on more problematic artwork that maybe would be really difficult to interpret visually if I have a painting with a lot of overpaint and I need to remove that. It's a difficult thing for people to understand. They see a swab full of paint and they're thinking like, what are they doing to that painting? You know. So I can actually work on visually sensitive artworks as well as my colleagues in hours before the museum even opens to the public. And even then it takes them about an hour or two to work their way up to where our center is. So careful thought actually went into, you know, when we, have ex when we can work without having to worry about the public, do we have spaces we can take off view, projects that are a little more visually sensitive. Um, you know, we don't work right up against the glass either. There is a space. They're looking into our labs. Um, but it really creates a wonderful moment to educate the public as to, what are the parts of a lab? You know, when, when our interpreter walks down the hallway, she's like, what do you think that big trunky thing is and what does it do? And she gets them to think critically, which is such an important part of what we do. But it's helping the public to think, you know, this is the thought process. Like, think about things, break them down. She doesn't just tell them what things are. She makes them think about, like, why do you think everything in the paper lab is covered up when it's not being worked on? She uses those, again, teachable moments to help the public to truly understand it. But that took a lot of thought pre-thought by the conservators. And when you mentioned the two years of planning before doing this visual project um, of the Night Watch, a great amount of responsibility, thought, careful messaging that goes into it again. All of that pre-planning, not just a quick snap and post. There's a lot, of, a lot of it that goes into it. And that's really important about that responsibility and interpretation, I think. I think we had a question in the back here. Uh, hi, I'm Joanna, I'm from Poland. I just wanted to get back to the social media topic, if you could. Um, I wanted to ask you, wherever you feel like um, our social media accounts should be connected to our personality, or should they be like, should they be connected to our private life, for example, should we post a selfie with a sculpture, or should it be kept just professional, just posting before and after picture, or Maybe we should attract, uh, like, if you if you don't work for like institution, I mean, as a freelancer, or should we attract maybe uh, private clients with our I don't know trustworthy face or just with the products and? <laughs> um, I personally wouldn't post a selfie with a sculpture. Uh, I don't. I sometimes do on my personal Instagram account post images of me working on objects. Uh, but it's yeah, just more because it's a private account, so it's just to show my friends and 
Um, but I wouldn't do it on a public account, I guess. And it, yeah, I would always explain it. Um, and what did I want to say? Sorry. Well, I, th I think there's a lot of probably social media experts out there who have a strong opinions about that. So I think um, <laughs> I would consult them. I didn't know much about uh, social media because I even don't have Facebook myself. But but uh, working with uh, young people, or students, it uh, um, often happens that already the project we are doing is uh, uh, known before I even myself understand that we are in scaffolding somewhere. And in uh, 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 so it's like. Uh, uh, to control the social media and when that's, uh, somebody is uh, making a selfie or some uh, painting which is uh, even not yet uh, uh, publicly known that it's a conservation is going on. And uh, now yeah, we at least try, uh, before we are starting uh, uh, the project, uh, uh, to discuss a little bit beforehand that also that when we put it in also a personal, uh, personal uh, um, whatever Facebook account or so it's uh, like uh, having bit also bad experience uh, that some uh, private owner for example doesn't want to be in uh, in, in uh, social media immediately so at least uh, we try to discuss before we ha start something uh, that when and then who says when you are allowed to put it on, on media and so yeah and, and any of the interns or fellows or employees that I have we always talk about number one um, that Nothing is to be post of their work unless they ask permission. Um, because they, again, we run into copyright issues, you run into to technical issues and problems. Um, and, and just thinking responsibly. It's like, it, it may be really exciting, but take a moment <laughs> and think about it. Um, uh, because yeah, you can take it down, but it does get seen and people then know about it. And this is the, this is the responsibility again. And when you put it out there, it really isn't possible to take it back, even when you take it down or you block it. It's been out there and someone may have grabbed a picture of it or, you know, the responsibility. Just think think twice, think carefully. Yeah. I think there was a question. Yeah, just just oh, yeah, one so comment. Sorry. I mean in, in, in large corporations there are clear rules, compliance rules and also communication rules. And you have to get release of certain information you want to give out because the impact you can probably sometimes do not foresee. So I would be very careful with that and I would I mean I would definitely recommend to keep the working and the private uh, sphere separate and um, and the other thing is, um, there is also a big opportunity because, at least from my perspective, I'm a little bit hesitant. I'm not a big social media person and I'm more like what I would call a social media immigrant, whereas you are social media natives. And, um, and honestly, in many museums you have exactly the same uh, museums with a, s a large proportion of immigrants. and. Um, and take that advantage and bring it to the table and bring it uh, in, uh, to the discussion. And uh, together as a team, you can reflect on risk and risk assessment. You can uh, also um, combine it with modern communication channels. And I think uh, together the two could add up to a very powerful strategy. But uh, this is also an opportunity again for you attending this uh, conference here to um, bring additional value into your organizations. And I would even say I wouldn't be surprised if you start to see um, repercussions from people who inappropriately do things like that, and it could one day cost you your job. So be very careful. Yeah. And they had a question over here. Um, from the social media table again? <laughs> oh, oh, social media in the back, and then we'll go yeah. to you right there. <laughs> and um, it's a question that was uh, asked at the beginning of the discussion. So the question was, what we could do um, and how we could share our knowledge outside of the social media. And you all already mentioned some other possibilities like these glass um, windows or um, interviews. Um, so maybe now you can um, make a conclusion how the um, social media, the, the value of the social media is compared to these other ways of um, going to the public. So where the, the um, Stellenwert, <laughs> so the, what could I say? How, um, 
how important so, so the social media like, is in comparison to the other So comparing ways. social media advantages over things like blogs or in-person or outreach um, type projects? Yeah, like that. Any ideas? Um, I mean, I can speak from my own. They're, they're all important. They're like a toolbox. There's different ways of using things, and each one of them has their value in a project and the advantage of it. I mean, person-to-person -person contact. Um, having uh, my director loves to take the donors through my lab, and it really helps the donors understand the collection and the care that's going into it and, and the messaging to the public. I mean, part of the Smithsonian is the dissemination of knowledge to broad audiences. It's the reason why the Smithsonian was, was created. So this idea that we are keeping to the mission of the Smithsonian and what we do um, helps our donors understand our commitment to the care of these collections. Um, that's a one-on-one. -on -one. That's a person and me showing them something. And then the messaging of videos versus uh, time-based media versus Facebook pages and Instagram and, and the messaging that goes out there. You know, th it's all diverse and each of those tools is going to give you an advantage in one way or another. Um, what I love is learning off of my peers. Like I am, I am watching the Rijksmuseum right now and seeing um, this other glass bubble, the other fish bowl that's out there very famously right now, and, and, and seeing the messaging and how it's done and learning from the success of projects such as you know, Hilke's projects and the success. I mean, when, when you were showing us about the sort of what would be the equivalent of a TSA agent helping to, to, to use x-rays and learning from you about how objects are scanned and, and what to look for in the trafficking of artwork in Estonia. I thought it was amazing. You're reaching out to these remarkable groups and using what your, your different types of technologies and uh, the way that you're reaching out to your communities is just remarkable. And again, reaching across to professions that are not conservation related. And she's doing that through the, the videos and the blog posts and the one-on-one -on -one and the social media. So it, it's, it's finding the right tool for the message that you need to send and the audience that you're going to reach out to. And, and I'd say know, your, know what audience you want to reach out to because that's where that tool is going to be really important. I mean, I'm not talking about museum, but from a business perspective, the, the, it's multi-channel. And uh, actually trying to find out what your customers, actually who your customers are and what their preferred channel is, is very important. So we still produce a catalog because we think it's important because we get the feedback, you can do marks and you can... And, um, and other industries say, oh, you, you still produce catalogs? That's outdated, you know, and uh, so, but individually it's a, it's a decision of which channel do you use and, and there's of course a web shop and there is trade fairs and there's, so it's kind of a, a mix of, of uh, communication channels and, and I think every institution or business needs to decide which matches best their products and their requirements to, to, to communicate, you know. So I think this is not one either or, it's more like the, the toolbox you set to mix. If that makes okay. sense. Yeah, I don't know if I have much to add, but this your example was very good. You have the catalog still, yeah, the physical catalog, but it's uh, exactly that uh, it's a bit same with this uh, virtual world, which is also the social media and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, but but uh, I have myself feeling that uh, somehow this all this uh, virtual possibilities are, are bringing people back to the physical world and then and that uh, was this uh, example of scaffolding because it's like uh, this physical emotion you get uh, which you never could get uh, via social media, via virtual web pages, uh, who knows what. And it's not only the age group, but that, that's on the old people who like the catalog. But I realized in our school, for example, your catalog, which is standing on the table, and then the, uh, it's uh, young people who are fascinated. The final, they can have a look a book, they <laughs> search in the internet. So we are kind of, yeah, it brings. <laughs> <laughs> brings back uh, uh, to the physical material object itself. Um, no. yes. yep. Well, we've had a very patient person over here, so we'll take your question now, please. Um, I have a question for when working in such a fish glass uh, bubble. Fish bowl. <laughs> yeah. Fish bowl, yeah. Um, do, do, how do, high do you think is the risk that people do get wrong what you're doing in there when you don't have the time to step up to explain it to them? How often do you think that it happens that they look at what you're doing and, and just did it, get it wrong? 
Got the wrong idea. Well, that's what the interpretive material outside the glass is about. So they can look in the glass, but outside the glass, there's a lot of interpretive material on the walls, in the kiosks that we have. We have videos interaction. We have, you can use your phone to dial in and hear the voice of a conservator talking about the thing that's by the glass. We have interpretive materials by the glass. So it, it's not just the looking. There's a lot of different ways um, that we reach out to the public so that when they're walking through that corridor, they're learning about conservation and we're not having to necessarily step out to, to talk to them about it. And if, we're, if I'm sitting in front of a microscope, let's say, consolidating a painting, or if I'm lining a painting, which we don't do much of, but you know, if I'm doing any of these complicated things, I will actually do a write-up. I'll work with my program coordinator and we'll have a sign that we put out saying, what, do you, what are you observing? What are you looking at? You know, what, what's going on here? And so we always make sure there's some sort of an interpretive element. And we choose different ways, just like we spoke about the different tools for social media, blog posts, tours. Um, we choose different ways of, whether it's wall text, whether it's video, my biggest thing to explain is when the conservator isn't on view. I'm like, where are they? But it's six o'clock on a Friday. Do you want to be sitting behind the glass? <laughs> it's like, you know, no, it's a, one of the, it's like messaging. Again, it comes back to what are their, we've learned over 13 years that we've had a lot of questions we've gathered from the public and we are reinterpreting ourselves to try to answer those questions and to make sure that there are answers there. So on the weekends now, because we're federal employees, we don't work on the weekend, but when is your biggest crowd in a museum on the weekend? So we're now gonna have a continually looping video along with the other interpretive material, which is going to talk about where are the conservators when you don't see them? Because we're off site looking at, at objects, because we're in the galleries dusting or caring for something, or we're traveling with an artwork to the other side of the world as a courier. So, you know, again, seeking what are our, what are our audiences interested in knowing? And we've now taking, we're taking those 13 years of questions and trying to answer them through new interpretive ways and choosing whether that best way, that best tool is a video or signage or whatever it may be. Um, but it's complicated and you learn along the way. But it, it's, it's... I think, um, I know that our um, social media department is actually collecting questions as they come in from the public, so actually, in the meetings that take place on a regular basis, you know, we're trying to address these questions that actually the public does have. So for instance, when we did some of the first videos, there was no voiceover or there was no teletext. It was just purely visual. But then there were so many questions about, well, this is great, but we don't really understand what's going on. So then the next one that was made it decided that there would be a sort of a teletext like you have on, on a news item. And then there were still questions. So now we're the next one's going to be done with voiceover. So I mean, you, it's, you have to respond to, um, to the public, to the kind of questions that come in, um, to develop a format that you, know, that you feel is, is the right one. Um, but I do know, I mean, we also get the statistics from, from our digital media department. We get regular sort of updates about you know, you know, about the Twitter accounts or the LinkedIn or the YouTubes or the videos. And apparently the videos are the things, the, um, the Q&A, the live chats, the videos, they're the things that actually get the most hits. Okay. All right, we're going to take a question here and then we'll go to the back there. Live chats. I would like to take the chance to ask the question to all of us uh, in that context. Um, I mean, we, there was a time when we all were general public and not professionals. And I think times are changing, but I have somehow the, the idea that still all these different channels are important. I would like to ask you, how did you first become familiar with conservation? Was it A, by uh, new media, internet? Was raise it? Hands. Raise your hands. Yeah. New media, internet? Google, yeah, that's, yeah, one, two, yeah, there are a few, and about traditional forms of exhibitions in museums, about conservation, yeah, a few more, one-to-one -one contact, someone knows someone who knows a conservator, <laughs> yeah, interesting. We should consider that. 
and to ask those questions in 10 years, which will be really interesting because the people who are seeing it now will be entering graduate school in the next eight to 10 years with the new growth of social media. So somebody remember that and ask those three questions in about eight to 10 years. I'm gonna to go to this, yeah, right here. Uh, hello, my name is Anna. Um, I want to know, like, uh, how much into consideration do you take the public uh, well, to conserve a picture, I mean. Uh, maybe you have a painting that is retouched many times and it has many layers from different times in the world. And maybe you are thinking about just removing one of them so you can see the other painting that it's under. Uh, but the public is like our clients. So do you take them into consideration? Do you ask them or it's just conservation I mean conservators and art historians who will make the decision. Do I ask the public how to conserve the artwork? No, 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 no. no. <laughs> I mean, not to conserve, but um, just to ask them, okay, we have this painting that it's been repainted like three times. Uh, one from the medieval times, the other one is from the Renaissance, and then the other one is Baroque. Uh, I mean, what do you think? Or maybe another example could be like, you have missing parts in a picture and you're thinking about retouching them, but maybe uh, a plain ink, it's like. So ask the public, uh, do you think we should, we should re redo what it's, what it's supposed to be there? Or I, th I think it's less of an ask and more of, a, a, of a, that critical thinking I spoke about earlier. We step them through a process. We present what we have. Um, in the case of, I, I, I had a painting recently that had a, the artist varnish on it. Um, now this artist had, was clear that he wanted yellowed varnish removed from his surfaces. Um, it had changed the tonal value of the painting. But that became a teachable moment to the public to say, but what if the artist hadn't said that? You know, what kind of things do you think we would consider? Posing them questions more about whether, not so much about efficacy, but to, to, to set them into a mindset of critical thinking that we often step through, but help them to understand that these decisions are not made in a vacuum, they're not made without careful consideration, and helping them to, to think the way that we think in a critical way. But I don't, um, I don't say, do you think we should remove this? You know, I, I, I say it in a different way. I say, let's consider a couple of options here. This was put on by another artist. You know, when, when you think about one artist that damaged another artist's work and then fixes it, do you remove that artwork? You know, and these are the questions I just asked them. I said, how would you feel about that? Do you think that that's appropriate or not? Or, you know, and I get them to think about it. Um, and, and it's just a way of really introducing them more to critical thinking and less towards, um, you know, getting an answer out of them or making them feel like, you know, they have to make a decision, something that they're really not trained to do, and it would be inappropriate to kind of put them in that kind of a hot seat, at least. So that's, what, that's what we try to do, is just lead them to, to understanding that there could be multiple answers to that question, not just one. I don't know if that answers it. I think we had over here, yeah. Hi, um, my name is Kim, and I had a question for Hilka and also Petrea. Um, obviously, you both have a great deal of um, experience in talking, gaining uh, collaborative decisions about this with um, curators within a museum context, and um, I'm wondering, um, you know, have have the curators always been very supportive, or have you also encountered um, curators that were not very comfortable with um, sharing things openly about conservation on social media or in the press, and how have you handled that? Have you um, been able to you know, convert any of them to being more open about it and in these uh, more transparent, or um, do you have tips for conservators in ways that we can um, convince our colleagues um, that um, what's appropriate to share and, and when? Um, well, it's usually not the curator who would make the decision about whether to share the information on social media. Um, 
you know, usually this is a discussion that's taking place with your marketing and communication department because, you know, uh, they're the ones that are responsible for what is released in terms of information. Though, if you've got important results, that would be a, maybe a decision that you would take, like with a whole team. Um, and not because the material is necessarily sensitive, but if you're going to bring out new results, art historical results or technical results, you always have to decide on what is going to be the moment to do that. You know, are we, uh, is it so important that we're actually going to have to uh, have a press conference about it? <laughs> you know, so there's all sort of levels of sensitivity. So it really depends on, on what it is you're sharing. I mean, I'm, my experience is most curators are incredibly open to discussion. You know, uh, you have to engage them. You know, so usually, you know, they're coming to the studio and they're following the process. Um, that has been always my experience. And of course, my experience has also been that you've often make new discoveries, important discoveries. And then you have to really decide on, well, what's the appropriate moment? How, how are we going to do that? Are we first going to publish it, you know, in a scientific journal? And then perhaps they want to take it up in a technical entry in a catalog that they're writing. So this is all part of a, a conversation you have. Um, if it's such an important discovery, then you also have to engage your marketing and communication department because anything that's newsworthy, they have to know about it. So, um, you know, it, it really depends on your organization, on the kind of discovery or the kind of news item. Um, it, it, really, it really depends, you know, it varies from case to case. Yes, uh, uh, first of all, it's uh, in Estonia, also a bit, uh, I think, different uh, situation. First of all, we, I think we, I, I don't know, never had, but at least now recently, or last year, so my professional career, this kind of uh, not conflict, but but uh, somehow the position fighting with uh, uh, curators. Uh, it's always like considered to be uh, quite equal partners, and, and but um, maybe again, like a bit exaggerated, tendency I uh, sometimes uh, uh, saw that that as um, conservation is somehow more attractive and more visible for for uh, people uh, 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 broad audience sometimes I, I had a feeling that the curators are almost uh, like jealous uh, that uh, the, if conservators are too much, uh, that they get too much attention or something like that. It's like just a feeling, but sometimes it could happen also that, that we are, our profession is maybe more attractive or more if we have a project which maybe it's mainly run by curator or whatever exhibition or some, uh, some uh, conservation information, but suddenly the cons conservators is uh, in the center. But, mm. We have a question over here. Mm -hmm. So I have a question related to this approach. I have seen mostly like in archeological zones or like small museums where they get involved, uh, like the community, the local community involved, like, um, so they have the opportunity to have like hands-on work uh, to do, for example, cleaning of pottery or like these kind of tasks. Uh, what do you think about it? Well, you know, we actually had an IIC Keck Award for the the hoard. What was it? The, the in I'm remember trying to remember the type, the name of the project. <laughs> Oh, and yeah, you, you're in the same as, but you know, and I'll draw back, you know, as you received the IIC Keck Award, this is a, a, um, a public engagement and outreach award that the IIC awards every two years when we have our Congress, and it talks about these types of projects that involve community awareness, raising awareness, but with, with, it was in <laughs> the north of England, and there was um, a, a Viking horde or something that the, with the... Oh, why am why I remembering? If you go to our website, <laughs> it's on it. Um, but it was an important project because it actually involved as an archaeological site, and it allowed the people in this very small village for a very popular site that was going on and, and was raising awareness through the papers. But the people in the village actually got involved with the recovery efforts, and they were trained about how to handle these artifacts and what to do with them. But they were a part of the assembly line, if you will, that got things to the conservator. But it, it also was wonderful because it involved community involvement. 
And, and it was wonderful to hear the interviews from the people in this very small community about this very important archaeological discovery. And it wasn't separate from them. It was now a part of their identity and a part of what their cultural significance was as a very small village in the middle of nowhere. And they felt really strongly attached to this very important discovery and their inclusiveness, getting them included in the project was really a, an important part, I think, of the public outreach of it. And it, it raised their awareness to, to conservation and the need for conservation. Um, so it was a fabulous educational opportunity, but my apologies for not remembering the, the actual name of the project. But Go to the IIC website under the <laughs> Keck Awards, and you're going to read about the whole story. It's wonderful. Just again, uh, the, just my personal experience in the same regard. As, uh, I showed this last project of this Baroque artist, Christian Ackerman. Um, <clears throat> It's also why we are always like communicating to local uh, people because it's a tiny village and then the, the local people, whatever kindergarten and, or school, uh, school age, they, Estonia is not very re religious country and then most people never realize that they have uh, uh, art values, uh, artistic value inside the church. And what we uh, often did, certainly control it beforehand, we, we uh, um, uh, we're uh, making the cleaning, dust cleaning together with, uh, with the local community. So they uh, immediately felt involved to the conservation project, like simple works. And then uh, they certainly, they are, uh, I mean, next time they are going to, to, to the church, it's completely different, the view to the artworks they have in, in their church, in the countryside churches. So it's sometimes, yeah. And, and I think, Patria, you mentioned earlier about in your own museum, the guards, the cleaning staff, getting to know everyone. I mean, I love giving our guards and our cleaning staff and our volunteers little extra tours, getting them involved in what conservation is about. And then it's amazing, they show up with their family members and other people, and they tell people to go upstairs and to see something. But you know, every opportunity, every connection that you make as a person to another person, as all those hands went up about how you learned about conservation, that's how you're reaching out in every day to your family and your friends and the people close to you and the people you work with in a museum. Yeah, no, it's yeah. absolutely true. I mean, um, yeah, I'm always amazed the guards will sometimes come up to you and say, well, you know, what, what have you discovered today? Or what's going on? Or, and then the next time you'll, you, you see them, they'll be engaging with the public and they'll be telling them what's going on because they heard it from, you know, somebody in the team. So, I mean, it, it's... Um, it's sort of, it's a very sort of positive thing to actually do. Communities um, comes in all shapes and sizes in many ways. All right, I think we've got a question there, and then Isa actually has a question, so. Hi, I'm Teresa. I'm doing my master right now in Bern, and I totally love to look at Instagram at like our conservation treatment posts. Um, but there's a thing I've noticed on the post and also like in real life talking to other conservators. We don't like to talk or sometimes we don't like to talk about the material like the solvents or stuff we use for the treatments. And I'm not sure but I think sometimes like on Instagram the mean comments and um, some pictures from colleagues who do like treatments, we don't really like how they are doing it. I'm not sure, maybe it's like also a f effect or it, it's getting worse that we don't talk about what really, what we are really doing. Like we are hiding more and more. I'm not sure, how do you think about it? Is it getting worse with like showing on Instagram what we are doing? I don't know about hiding more and more. I mean, I think there certainly is a delicacy in what you talk about. You know, I mean, are you, do we really need to talk about what we're using in materials? I'm I mean, do we need to tell someone, I cleaned this painting with a three to one mixture of acetone to isopropanol? And blah, blah. Do you need to go there or do you just need to say, can you talk about the methodology of, you know, we, we needed to remove a discolored varnish because the varnish had yellowed over time. You know, this is one thing, you know, uh, I, I think you, you run down that rabbit hole real quickly because then you're, you're providing information to people who don't know how to control that material 
and they could uh, yeah. misappropriate that. And so that's a, I would say it's better to stay away from that. And, and whenever I run across something from a colleague that I see that I have a reaction to, I reach out to that colleague personally. I don't post an opinion on a, on a blog for other people to then either jump on or jump off. Or, it's like I, I reach out to them as a colleague and I say, oh, you know, I noticed that you posted this. You know, at, what made your decision in that? Uh, you know, hey, I had a similar problem. And, you know, I, I approach them as a colleague with respect and I speak with them in that way. I don't use a public platform to, to denigrate them or to, to call question or to shame them. You know, I, I really, I make an effort to, to try and, because you don't know the reasons behind why they posted what they posted, so maybe giving them the benefit of the doubt and, and being a gentle hand that reaches out and, and helps them to find another way of communicating what they wanted to communicate. Mm -hmm. And I, I think it's important, no, that's very, very true. I think it's also important to be uh, very careful about the images you choose, because a lot of images are unclear, actually, what is, you know, what is actually going on in the image. So be very careful about the kind of image you post. Make sure it's a clear image um, that it can't be misinterpreted. Um, so I think you have to be very responsible about, about that. And I totally agree with your comments about, you know, the, the context of the information and the type of information that you're posting. So, you know, it's, um, I mean, the public, I don't think is particularly interested exactly in what the formulation was that you used to clean it, but, why it was possible to remove it, or you know, the, the fact that the varnish um, is not an original varnish, but was in a varnish that was applied 50 years ago by, you know, I, I get so many questions about that. Well, wh why is it possible to remove a varnish? So, you know, the, I think that that is a, what, uh, a question that's very frequently um, asked. And I think you have to be careful not to risk that somebody at home thinks Oh, I also have a painting with the yellow varnish, and if you exactly tell the materials, I'll try myself if it works. I think that's also. I have another question, um, not social media, but if you actually, for example, at the Rijksmuseum, do guided tours, just focusing on the conservation aspects, not just to when you open an exhibition, but regularly. Yeah, sure. Our education department is very active about that. So we also provide input to our education department. Um, this is the year of Rembrandt. So we've provided information, sort of technical information about Rembrandt, about Rembrandt's pigments, about his painting technique. So, um, and for the night watch, the treatment of the night watch, we've provided uh, input for the text on the walls and also for, for the multimedia tours. So we're constantly sort of writing text, editing text. Are um, you actually going with the people through? No, no, no. The education department is actually the, the people who are physically going through the galleries. And, and we it's provide been there for the a very long time because when I was a graduate student in 2006, doing my summer internship in France, we, we went to Amsterdam at one point, and I stood there in front of the night watch, and there in the, in the pocket, was you pulled out the pocket information about the night watch and there were the x-rays and the analysis that had gone on and this was before social media it was so big but you know you were you were already communicating and reaching out to the public at the Rijksmuseum regarding the night watch you know 10 years ago 11 years ago 12 years ago and it was it was exciting for me to see that as I was getting ready to consider going in an internship to the London Conservation Center, this idea of, wow, this is, this is a great way of interpreting to the public. I really complicated the vandalism that had happened to the painting. It was all there in this wonderful little, you could sit in front of the painting and look at it and, and learn from it as the public. And I was completely fascinated by that. And that was in 2006, so well done. Social media? Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> There's one last question from the internet. Um, and last time I forgot to mention where it came from. Um, this question is from César from Colombia. So hi to Colombia. <laughs> um, and it merges really good with another question. Um, and it's about why you think the cases of, for example, this Eka Homo who was uh, conserved really poorly or um, some YouTubers with questionable ethics are more popular, more famous um, than the actual investigations of our field and how we handle it. Um, if we see something that attracts a lot of attention, which is not really done in a way we would, we would do it. 
You know, I, I've been asked that Eke Homo question so many times at the Wonder Conservation Center. And, I, and actually, I've, I've turned it into a teachable moment. So the first thing I say is that, let's just face this was a person who cared about their cultural heritage. She may not have done what we would have wanted her to do, but she cared about it. Now, where we failed is that she didn't know about conservation. The message was not out there. Her community didn't realize that there were possibly resources they could have reached out to to have approached it a little differently. Now, wouldn't it be wonderful in a future world where if you've got a person who goes to a church and they're seeing this, this artwork that they treasure, that they see every year by year as they pass, this was an elderly person, watching it deteriorate, watching her cultural heritage fall off the wall. At least she had the desire to do something. Not that I want to encourage people to do that, but when I talk about it, I say, but imagine if she knew about conservation. And not only that she knew about conservation, that she knew that she could activate her community to find a way to solve the problem. If she'd have known that information, would she have still made the same choices? Or would it be a very different story, and it would be like other stories we hear about, which are great success stories, because they're aware of where they need to go to reach out. And so this is where this is gonna become, in my personal opinion. So I take that, and I, and I don't shame her. I just say, you know, imagine if she had that information, if she knew there was an alternative to sneaking in at night and trying to make it look better because she didn't want to lose it. I mean, that was the real core, is that she cared. She actually cared. So, you know, I, I, I don't want to shame her. I, I wanted her to learn there's other ways, you know, and, and that's the more important message. Like, how do we get it out there so that people know that we exist and that there are possibilities for people to make other choices than to, to sneak in in the middle of the night and do something that then becomes a huge media sensation that maybe she wasn't looking for? Say. So, where are we are running out of time? We had that moment? No, okay, wasn't sure. Oh, you want to go? Oh, we've got a question. Mariana. Yeah, I just wanted to shortly comment that um, um, right now online there is a lot of conservation videos where the methods and processes of the conservation are being detailedly explained. And this is, these are viral videos, so these are millions and millions of p people watching. And I think, I personally don't agree that, this, uh, that the methods and the materials should be named because of the uh, um, <coughs> things you already commented. But I think through the reaction from the public, I would assume that they are interested in this. So what's, what are your thoughts on this? So I can, I can think of colleagues who are posting videos of their treatments from soup to nuts Fast forward over time lapse, um, and and for me, it, it ethically it's it's very problematic. Um, I think it's uh, something they should choose another path for. But we we have to get out there and explain it. Then you know, if this is going out there, then there's got to be a response. And and I'd be curious to hear what the panel thinks about how we respond to these challenging situations because this idea of advertisement through optimizing the, the, the thrill of m videos and so forth. I mean, that is very challenging. I think I'm more comfortable with that kind of information in scientific journals. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, it, it's, I think it, there's gonna be more of it that comes out, certainly, and yeah. I mean, this is something we encounter uh, every once in a while that people come to us and want to buy some things and want to do some things with it, and then you ask, what do you want to do? And if you have the chance actually to ask, sometimes it's more anonymous, and then you say, you better consult a conservator, but we don't have a feedback loop. There are certain materials which are, of course, restricted. You don't sell, but there's a, there's a, um, there's a big, 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 big gray zone. So. Um, um, this is really a, a sensitive topic, and um, we as a, as a supplier um, f sometimes have the opportunity to actually route them to conservators and take the fear that this is necessarily expensive or too expensive and uh, all these kind of things. So um, again, this is often and really that I recommend one of our clients saying, um, where do you work or where, where, where do you live? Um, you can approach his or her or, or, um, a workshop or the studio and ask them. Um, so, so that is the one aspect I think um, 
we try to contribute and try to navigate um, carefully uh, whenever we when, whenever we hit such a discussion. The other thing I, I think when you communicate about what you do, it's again fears. And um, I think there are parts in the communication that sh should not be disclosed to a broader public. But on the other hand, I think it's very important. We have producers, and again, our market is a very small, we are a niche. And none of the big producers of materials, etc., produces for conservation, or only very few. So um, it is, if we don't get feedback on the materials and, and what you do, it's, explicitly on, 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 on treatments you prefer over another, then it's difficult for us to, to develop the portfolio and to, to actually support those companies who, who do produce for, for us um, to plan ahead. And, and, uh, and um, so uh, I think it's, not, it's important not just to, to shut down communication because uh, it could be misused. It's really a matter of whom do you talk and whom do you give access to certain level of information. And within the ecosystem, uh, if you don't communicate, you don't have to be, um, you, know, you shouldn't wonder that one day uh, a certain material or a certain tool is not available anymore. Because uh, producers, and I, I speak to name producers, they sometimes uh, f feel to be locked out or cut off a discommunication path. So there's, there's always two sides to it. And I, I, would, I would really like to encourage you to be open within the OCA system and in a, in a very selected way, but um, to be careful in the, in the other way, if that makes sense from Yeah, I liked your analogy earlier about being like the, the dental care. <laughs> it's like, if we raise awareness and education about the importance of conservation, Maybe people would be less likely to want to try to do it on their own if they understand the value of what we do. And so raising awareness to the importance of that, you know, refocusing, like n not, not criticizing or anything like that, but just finding a way of being proactive um, to the situation and responsible in the way that we reach out is really important. I think responsible is the key word. I, I know, I think we produced, when I worked at the Marathos, there was a YouTube video produced about the cleaning of the ceiling pens in the golden room at the time and it had one of these um, lead salt crusts and the video that we produced was really about a protocol a procedure that we um, developed about how to go about removing that kind of a crust um, but it actually showed the, the, pr the procedure and the testing so it was actually quite detailed. So if you're going to talk about cleaning, they do it in a in a responsible, appropriate way. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a question of like, you know, taking, you know, a certain solvent and cleaning a painting, but actually to talk about the complexities involved. I was telling Patria earlier, one of the things when I first saw the videos coming out about the Night Watch was that, that I loved that they were doing the analysis first to justify the decisions that were being made. They're, they're, they're being a great advocate for our field and showing the complexities of really understanding materials and context and what the decisions are. So um, I, I applaud you tremendously for that because I know you had to fight for that probably that to, to show that slow process, but it's so important to what we do. And so that kind of messaging again, getting it out there and uh -huh. so forth. So I think again, it's about being responsible that if you are going to be putting this all out in social media or interviews or newspapers, then you have to understand what the impact of that is. Yeah and then be responsible about how, you know, um, or, or take that opportunity to actually push for what you think is really appropriate. Um, and I think, you know, like I said, I think that that is the way to proceed with any treatment, in fact. Well, we only have five minutes left, and I wanted to give the speakers an opportunity if there was anything further that you, you wanted to express from any of the questions or anything you wanted to say to this incredible group that we have both online and, and in the room? Any final statements from our speakers? Any guidance for them? You want to tell them, Ralph, uh, about uh, with the support that you give to students uh, in helping them with their projects? <laughs> Again, I, I think it's important to use this platform and um, get in touch with the different professions or the different levels of experience and don't be shy 
don't hesitate. And uh, I just want to stress again that I'm, 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 for me, it's today it's very difficult. We have like 500 suppliers, and it's it's it is not so much difficult to get innovation. Everyone is keen on innovation, but it's very difficult to maintain a portfolio. And if you have like producers like Lascaux or Gambling, etc., who who have a broad commercial portfolio, I call it, for artists, supplies, etc., and they they have this little um, part of conservation materials they they um, they 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 produce, and sometimes commercially it's not fully justifiable, but they are passionate about it. And for them, it's very important, uh, and many others, I couldn't name a long list now, but uh, to get feedback. And therefore, so um, I would also like to encourage you, this is a great platform for this, to, to interact and give feedback. They sometimes feel a little bit left outside, and, um, and, and it's important because we all depend on each other in a way. So, and I think it was a great discussion to, to show this interconnectedness and um, to make our work, or our work, uh, the work of this broader ecosystem more boundaryless. And uh, in, in, I, I can only repeat, uh, go on the stage. <laughs> yeah, I just uh, wanted once more to... Uh, to say how great, uh, great event it is, and then it's uh, very well organized. And then the, uh, next time I know to promote this event for uh, among our students as well. So I hope we have more than one Estonian, an Estonian <laughs> in next conference, and it's well done. Yes, no, I mean, absolutely. Um, I think it's, it's very important to talk about, um, and, and I think it's already been talked about. It'll be interesting to see the impact of social media, you know, in 10 years' time. Um, I think sort of my, probably my final conclusion would be what I mentioned earlier, and that is like, you know, sort of looking at the bigger picture, I think. Um, I think that that's very important in conservation, sort of trying to understand what the bigger picture is in the context of, of what it is um, that you're doing. I think um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with our marketing and, and um, communication head just a couple of days ago, and it was about that so often we sort of take for granted all the details in what it is that we're doing, and we kind of forget that for the public, even something small can be really very interesting. So you often don't have to go into a lot of detail to engage the public. And that's part of that sort of looking at the bigger picture, you know. So if you take the time to really think about what it is that you're doing or the significance of what it is, how it impacts on the meaning of the object, that's what's probably more important than talking about what solvent you might have used. <laughs> Um, I just want to say that I had, thanks to the last student conference, the great opportunity to help starting the Instagram account of IAC. So it would be wonderful if this student conference will bring somebody who will do it with me. Well, thank you all for your time. We really appreciate it. Oh, one more comment. One more comment. <laughs> I just looked it up. The date for the next uh, European Day of Conservation Restoration is the 13th of October in 2019. And it's already said that it is the 11th of October in 2020. And I think within this group we got so many ideas in this discussion how to share our reality with the public in a smaller or greater or more analog or more digital form and I would like to use the chance to also bring that idea to IIC. So far it's called European Day of Conservation Restoration, not International Day of Conservation and Restoration. Why not to make an International Day of Conservation and Restoration out of it and to further spread that idea? It has it was an enormous success last year. Uh, it was the first time. This year it's the second time. Let's spread that idea and grow this because I think 
if we all participate in that, that could have an enormous impact. And I think it would be fantastic if IIC would, might want to pick that idea up. Well, on that note, let's give a round of hand to our speakers, please. Thank you. OK. On behalf of the local organizing committee, I would like to thank you all for being here. In this year's IIC Student and Emerging Conservator Conference, we had participants from around 20 countries including European countries and also Australia, the United States of America, China, Turkey, and Canada. In the three sessions, we reflected on our role as conserver conservation professionals, as well as our position in institutions, and discussed possible future developments of the profession, as well as our possible path in that field. In the third session, we discussed the increasingly important role of communication with and the outreach to the general public and have heard about some inspiring approaches. I hope you all enjoyed the sessions and vivid discussions. And I would like to thank the speakers and moderators of all three sessions for your participation and for sharing your experiences. And of course, And of course, I would like to thank you all for being here and also the ones watching online for your interest, your energy, your questions and the participation in the discussions. Again, many thanks to the local organizing committee, Professor Ferreira and Professor Heidenreich. And uh, yeah, an applause, please. <laughs> And also to the staff of the University of Applied Sciences who, for making this conference possible. <laughs> and last but not least, I would like to thank the team of IIC, um, especially Graham Vos and uh, Joe Kirby and Mikkel Scharf and Kate Smith for their support and advice in organizing this conference. And with this, I would like to pass over to you, Amber. Okay. Go ahead. Can I just shortly interrupt? Yeah. Or maybe you have some final yeah. but, uh, Don't perfect. go away. I think so, yeah. Oh, it's like Gloria. <laughs> That's okay. Well, you can come up and join me. <laughs> well, I just wanted to, I, I mean, I was asked to do closing comments, but those were fabulous closing comments. So a round of applause. Yes, thank you. Make my job easy. <laughs> So as a representative of the IIC, I, I, I just wanted to share a little intangible cultural heritage with you. Uh, my grandfather was a great storyteller, and so I'm, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, when I was a graduate student, uh, I became a member of the IIC in the United States based on what a professor had told me. She's like, get internationally involved, know who your colleagues are internationally, reach out but mostly to learn about different perspectives from different cultures. And so I did, and I was a member throughout my graduate years. And then in 2008, the lab that I was going to received an IIC Keck Award, which was the Lunder Conservation Center. And when they went to go receive that award, I applied for a Vermel grant, and I went to my first IIC conference, which was in London. And I got to see the facility that I had just spent a year at an internship with, and now was a fellow at, receive this wonderful award about public outreach and advocacy. So there I was in 2008, and they had a student meeting, and I went to it, and I received my Vermel Award, and I got to meet the students, and I also got to meet the president. Because let me tell you something about IIC. There are two and a half employees, two and a half people employed to run everything that the IIC does, everything. So I first I want to give an applaud to those two and a half employees, who are Sarah and Graham. <laughs> <laughs> Because when I learned that, my mind was absolutely blown away as a student. And then I learned about this amazing council and the offices and all the people who are volunteering their professional time to do things. 
And as I got to know Jerry Padani, he said, you know, we need more people like you, everyone in this room, to participate, Amber. And I was like, well, how can I participate? And the first thing he asked me to do was to form a student poster session at one of the conferences, because they had no student representation. And I did that. I worked with Maram Nays, who was a, a student from the Courtauld, and the two of us on the opposite sides of the pond came up with a way of, of, of advertising for student posters, which you will see in a few months from the IIC as we approach our next Congress. And we encourage you, because this is an opportunity where students, your peers, your emerging conservators, and I ask you if you're an emerging conservator and are interested, please let us know. But there's basically an administrator and then four students. And we, we formulated a way in which students could submit abstracts and be considered for posters, and we published them online. And we allow them to use QR codes to be able to link to blogs and to other more expanded information about their research. And this is for students who are in school, students who are graduating, students who are emerging in the first five years of their career, so that you're not forgotten about in the things that you are doing. So I actively say, reach out and look for that student posters. So that was my first involvement. And the second involvement was to form a Facebook page and a Twitter account. And, and just as Issa is doing for us fabulously, thank you very much, Issa, on Instagram, when she said, you're, done, you're not on Instagram, we're like, well, how would you like to help us with Instagram? So, you know, we, we are actively always looking for people to, to be a part of the IIC, to bring new ideas, to help us continually be up to date because we are only two and a half people employed to running all of this. And everything else is everything you see out of the council. And to be a part of a council of people who are dedicated, truly dedicated in their personal time and efforts and professional links to, to giving back to the field, to advocating for the field, for doing so much. So when you ask what IIC can do for you, think about what you can do for the IIC too. Become a member, help us out. We are an independent organization, we're not linked to a government. We are you, we're all of you together. And in a world where things are becoming increasingly shut out, it's important to be open and to reaching out to each other. And this is an organization that does that. I am, no I am so proud when I sit in on a council meeting and I see my colleagues from all around the world. And I think of just where I've come in the 12 years since I graduated from school and what's going on in this world and the things that I'm participating in. And it's because I made an active choice. And it's not always easy. Sometimes I am on two eight-hour Skype day conference calls. But it was that dedication and it is that linkage and it's that camaraderie and the fellowship of being a member of an organization like this that is extremely rewarding. It will open up incredible doors for you. And I can tell you that from my own personal experience, and you're going to see an article come out. Uh, we're going to start telling stories about these successes of people who have come through the IIC. And I ask you all to please look for those in our news and conservation. So pay attention to the IIC. Help where you can. And if you've got a great idea, please don't hesitate, because it's such a small, active, vital group of people that they actually listen to students a student created the student conferences, and this is the fifth one. And every year, some student in the audience or online has stepped forward and said, I want my school to be next. I want to be the next representative of an IA. We don't, we don't reach out. We've never reached out to a school and said, will you host our next one? It's always been from the audience that this has come. So it's incredible. And you come up with the subjects. We don't tell you what the subjects are. You come up with it. You reach out to the speakers. And all that happens is the IIC office and our resources, we support your growth and understanding. And you can ask Mariana or Charlotte or all of their colleagues. They had it. They had a team to go to, for, to ask questions of. But this was all of them. So kudos to all of you. You did an incredible job. And we are so proud to have worked with you. And so I'm going to ask the team to please come to the front. I would like all of you, come on, don't sit down. Get up. Come up here. We need to see faces. You are the face of the success of this, and thank you. We have one more coming down. Come on, come on, get up, Texas. So think about it. You could be standing up here in two years, and we hope you are. <laughs> and we have a special um, little gift uh, that will be presented by Sarah. Hold on.
shall I give it to you, Marianne? Thank and you apparently very much. it's a vegan option. Oh, yeah. thank you, thank you. Thank you well, for thank you. Thank you. <laughs> You've all done for And a great thanks to all of you for coming, for being a part of this, for showing up, for participating. And it'll be interesting to see over the coming years the people you've met here at this conference. And then when you look out in the audience, the, the, the faces you may recognize in your own professional career in the coming years. So good luck to you all. I wish you all the best. And thank you for those who were patient online as well. Thank you. I would like to ask for a round of applause for Hannah Pesh and Leonie Corte that they are doing the catering right now, and they're not here, but uh, please, I think they're watching us online, so please, um, <laughs> round of applause. <laughs>